23rd will come to order, please. Roll, roll call, city clerk. How do carbons? Mr. Abraham. Present. Mr. Galt. Present. Mr. Rhodes. Here. Mr. Wilson. Present. Mayor Kaler. Present. Uh, tonight we'll have Commissioner Abraham lead us in our invocation and our Pledge of Allegiance after our invocation is Peyton Kraft and he's uh, in middle school, an 11 year old in middle school at Mayfield. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you for this day, this beautiful autumn day. We thank you for the opportunities. And Father, we thank you for the challenges. Look down upon us and through your spirit, grant us wisdom, understanding. But grant us the initiative to do what we hear in each of our capacities to do. Let us do it with a conviction. Let us do it with a clear conscience. As we gather together, we represent those who we represent. Let your character be consistent with our efforts. These things we ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Peyton. Come on up. You can you can use the microphone here. You can you can go right here. Speak now. Speak now. There you go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job. Thank you, Peyton. City manager, any additions or deletions? We have one addition, Mayor, uh, Resolution A, Paducah Power System, call to action. Okay, thank you. Um, in case you're wondering what this is, it's not for the person that asked the best question tonight. <laughs> it's, it's actually uh, this week, uh, it may be the whole month, is Senior Citizens Week. And uh, <clears throat> to show their appreciation to the city of Paducah, they gave us this award today uh, for providing uh, the facility that they use to have their fellowship, to have their meals. And uh, the city of Paducah does provide that location for them as well as the utilities. So they just, this was their way of thanking us. Oh, pretty. Very nice. We have, um, a couple of proclamations tonight. So Peyton Kraft and Sarah Wilson Kraft, if you'll um, come forward. Okay, Peyton and Sarah, from the office of the mayor, a proclamation. Whereas hydrocephalus occurs when excess fluid builds up in the brain, most often because of an obstruction preventing proper fluid drainage, and whereas the United States Congress passed a resolution in 2009 designating the month of September as National Hydrocephalus Month, and whereas representatives from the national, regional, state, and local pediatric hydrocephalus foundations, along with leadership, Various professional, community, and medical-based organizations are dedicated to increasing public awareness of hydrocephalus, including the need of families with children diagnosed with hydrocephalus. Now, therefore, I, Gail Kaler, Mayor of the City of Paducah, do hereby proclaim September Hydrocephalus Awareness Month in Paducah, Kentucky, and ask people of Kentucky to join us in increasing the public awareness of hydrocephalus and the need for support for more effective to address the effects of the disease and find cures or ways to prevent the disease. Would you like to say anything, Sarah? Yeah. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here today. Look over here. You want me to get in here with me? Thank you. And we have Samantha Williams here with us on Adult Education Week. Are you here, Samantha? Hi. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Whereas it is appropriate to promote increasing the ad educational attainment level of Kentuckians and encouraging qualified residents of Paducah and McCracken County to enroll in free services provided by the McCracken County Adult Education Center. Whereas September 22nd through 28th, 2014, is National Adult Education and Family Literacy Week, whereas 4,764 adult residents of Paducah and McCracken County lack a high school or GED diploma. Whereas an individual who earns a high school or GED diploma earns an average of 9,300 more per year than a high school dropout. Whereas an individual who earns a high school or GED diploma can enter post-secondary education, thereby increasing employment opportunities and earning potential. Whereas the most effective way to improve the academic success of a child is by improving the educational level of the parent. Whereas individuals without a high school credentials are two times as likely to be unemployed, three times as likely to be in poverty, and eight times as likely to be incarcerated. Whereas our local economy Economic development, educational attainment efforts are incumbent upon a college and career ready population. Whereas the McCracken County Adult Education Center can assist adults in obtaining a national career readiness certificate, earning a GED diploma, and becoming more college and career ready. Now therefore, I, Gail Kaler, Mayor of Paducah, Kentucky, do hereby proclaim September 22nd through the 28th 2014 as Adult Education Week in Paducah and encourage residents to support the work of the McCracken County Adult <coughs> Education. Thank you. thank you. Would you like to say anything? Thank you. I just want to say thank you for just your right support. Yeah. Just thank you for your support and we look forward to being able to serve the residents of McCracken County. Thank you so much. You're thank welcome. you. Thank you. Okay, we have a presentation by Prairie State Energy Campus, and I would like to uh, ask everyone tonight that wants to speak, we, we do have several people that have signed up tonight, I would like to keep it to three minutes per person and not go over 40 minutes uh, with your comments or your questions. So if you haven't signed up, please sign up on the paper outside, and that would help us expedite this. Okay, Dave, we have, we have Dave Clark here tonight with us from Paducah Power and he's here to introduce um, from Prairie State. Thank you, Dave. Mayor Kaler and uh, members of the City Commission, I want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to uh, give this report to you. I was looking through my notes. I think we've done it uh, three times over the years, but we did miss last year, and for that I apologize. And so we uh, appreciate the opportunity this evening to uh, speak to the commission. I have some folks with me uh, from the Prairie State Energy Campus. As you all well know, that's uh, the plant where we get about 75 to 80 percent of our energy needs. So. It affects our health quite a bit, and so we're focused on it, and uh, you'll hear uh, reports. We have three of the senior leaders at the Prairie State uh, Energy Campus, and first I want to introduce Mark Gherkin. Mark, put your hand up. Mark is the interim CEO and chairman of the board, and there's nine board members, and I'm pleased to serve with Mark on it and represent Kempa, which is a... Uh, was founded by the Princeton Electric Plant Board and the Paducah Power System. Uh, 
He's also the president and CEO of American Municipal Power, known as AMP, in Columbus, Ohio, and he's one of the largest joint action agencies in the country. <coughs> Next, I want to introduce Randy Short. Randy is our chief operating officer. He's the number two man at the plant. We don't have a number one man at the plant. We're conducting interviews uh, for the new CEO and hope to maybe have a selection made in about a month. So Randy is the number two man, and he has two decades of experience in the utility industry. Uh, we got Randy from the Dynegy power plant known as Baldwin, which is about six miles away from the Prairie State plant. It's a slightly larger plant, being about 1,800 megawatts, whereas uh, Prairie State's about 1,620. And so Randy has got an extensive background in burning Illinois coal. That's what we burn. That's our fuel supply. So I'm pleased to have him here to report on, on uh, progress in getting the plant up and operating. Uh, next fellow we have is Paul Krivokuka, known as PK. PK, put your hand up. Mm -hmm. He's the senior vice president of the mining operation and directly across the street from the power plant is, is a, a mine. It's a mine mouth plant. We own a 30 plus year coal supply and all the fuel for the plant is comes out of that mine and, and Paul works about uh, three to four hundred uh, coal miners contract and, and some of them are our own employees. Uh, I also have Rick Sauter home here. He's our consultant from uh, Lidos Consulting, known as the old R.W. Beck. I have Heather Overby. She's the Chief Financial Officer with the Kentucky Municipal Power Agency. I have Andrea Underwood, uh, who handles public relations for us and, and customers. And I have Hardy Roberts, who's our new chairman. And Hardy, put your hand up. I think everyone knows you're here. <laughs> so I'm going to Pass the mantle over to Mark and right. get started. Before you all get started, I just wanted to um, say something, okay? Go ahead. Before you start your presentation. And I would also like to say that we have Mayor Gail Cherry here with us today from Princeton. So welcome, Gail. Sure. Thank you for attending. Um, I think the public has three expectations when it comes to power. They want abundant power that's reliable. They want it at an affordable rate. And we have no question that Paducah Power is providing citizens with abundant, reliable power. However, the rates are the community's concern. Uh, we're here with the, tonight with a mission um, to understand uh, and of moving forward and the changes I think that are occurring on the board is going to move us forward And I think you've got some good ideas some things that you're, you want to work on we need to keep moving in that direction Paducah power system and representatives of Prairie State Energy Campus are here To help everyone understand the current situation regarding the plants operation Paducah Power and Princeton Power are equity owners in Prairie State Energy Campus in Illinois. Prairie State provides Paducah Power with a majority of its power needs. Construction of the plant began in 2007. However, since the plant came online and over the past several months, the plant has not been able to operate at a level that we need. As a result, Paducah Power has had to purchase power on the open market we all feel the pain of the need to purchase power in the form of power cost adjustments that show up on our bills. I have heard several stories of businesses struggling to keep their doors open. Some are considering closing. Plus, I know that residents are having an extremely hard time paying their bills and having to make hard financial choices. We empathize with you because we are you. I'm there too. The commission is there too with you. They understand this. We're listening. 
and we know you want financial relief. So how do we get lower power bills? Simply put, the Prairie State plant must begin to operate in a reliable, steady manner. So tonight we have Dave Clark, the General Manager of Paducah Power, and three representatives of Prairie State. Thank you for being here. Our goal tonight is to listen, ask pertinent questions, determine whether or when the plant will get to its full operational capacity. So welcome, gentlemen, and we look forward to your presentation. And I think you'll get some good answers, and I'm going to turn it over to these three gentlemen, and they've got a presentation, uh, a slide presentation they'd like to uh, make. Mike or Mark? Yep, thank you. Thank you, Dave and Mayor and Commissioner. Do you, do we want, are we going to just hold questions till the ask? Okay, I appreciate it. I am an ex-city manager, so I do appreciate this whole process. I kind of miss it at times, but it was when I had brown hair and not silver hair. So um, what we're going to try to do is, is update you as much as possible on uh, where the plan is. It's just a quick little overview. Prairie State really is the, the generator of the baseload electricity for the ownership group, which, as Dave said, is nine individual owners. Uh, between us and, and uh, KMPA is the wholesale market. Uh, all the generation of electricity is scheduled through that regional transmission uh, organization, which they call them RTOs. They're independent uh, uh, entities. Uh, the electricity in Illinois is scheduled through the MISO as well as the PJM. It goes through uh, transmission lines. We do not own those transmission lines, nor do the owners. And then it gets into the distribution systems of each one of uh, our, our individual members uh, and each one of the owners, uh, with the exception of Peabody, the developer. They, uh, I, I believe, sell theirs into the market. They had market. I don't think they have any long-term contracts. Just to give you a snapshot, Prairie State owners serve more than 2.5 million families in eight states, and it just gives you a representative of, of the uh, nine owners of, from that. Uh, it really is a public power partnership. Uh, it represents, Prairie State represents the investment of Midwest, uh, Midwestern municipals and rural electric cooperatives in stable baseload power. 95% of us are power co-ops or municipals, and 124 megawatts is produced and used by communities in Kentucky which represents the whole uh, membership, represents about 10% of the public power ownership. Um, really what we are is about, is like the mayor said, is reliable, uh, just system reliability, improve economics uh, for both the economic uh, cost as well as development, and preparing ourselves for inevitable market uh, changes through generation investment. Um, I want to talk a little bit, and I'm not the uh, technical guy, so when we get to some slides, I'm going to punt it to PK or Randy to give you that technical background. But I want to talk a little bit about where we're headed with leadership and reliability, because I think it's very critical. Um, we've had a change in leadership, and, and we felt we needed to make that change. As uh, Dave was saying, we are under a search right now. In fact, it's my charge to do that as a committee before I became chairman, so I'm very motivated to do a great job as well as get this person on as soon as possible. Um, we, as Dave said, we are on final interviews on September 30th. I believe strongly that uh, we have uh, some excellent candidates, and uh, based on what I know, we should have this person uh, in the office uh, in Illinois by the first week of November if things go well. Uh, with us is, as Dave said, a good explanation of Randy Short. I will tell you that uh, we looked at our org chart. We decided we needed to bring better expertise in from the plant side, from a leadership perspective, and the understanding of Illinois coal and how to run these plants. Uh, Randy comes with a great background, uh, both uh, on, the, on the coal side, not the coal side, but the, the, the coal generation fleets. Uh, both subcritical and supercritical, so we feel very lucky that we were able to uh, to bring him on as fast as we could. Uh, PK, his uh, vice president of generate, or PK is, uh, excuse me, I should go back. We also have Tom Kordick, and Tom is a, he's uh, one of the ones that came on from the plant early on, has uh, produced a lot for us in the last uh, five months since we've moved him up the ladder and doing well, as well as uh, Ken Pullman, and uh, that was brought over by Randy to bring more expertise in our shop. 
And so we feel very comfortable um, from the power generation side right now of where we're at. We have a young workforce though. Um, and so we started with zero employees. Back when we started construction, we had to hire those. There was a lot of training expertise and uh, the, we have a lot more to do as you'll hear. Uh, the other gentleman with me is PK, the senior vice president of the mine. Um, the mine has uh, operated very well. The construction went on uh, without any increases on schedule. Uh, the impacts of the mine have been significant from a operational perspective because of the plant being up and down in the production of coal. But uh, we have great leadership on the mine side. Um, and I, I'll let the folks talk about our campus safety team, but uh, safety is, uh, is something that we're achieving uh, great uh, comparisons to the national averages. We don't try to compare to national averages. We think uh, we need to be better than the year before and keep improving that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, reliability, uh, the plant BNV, the monitoring and diagnostic programs, uh, the instrument and control reviews, the power plant projects. Um, I'm going to let these folks talk about each one of these as I go forward, the business systems improvements and the mine enhancements. So uh, as we walk through there, we're going to, we're going to discuss uh, most of these. Um, the number one thing that we're concerned on right now is the production improvement. I just gave you a snapshot, and, and what we really talk about is capacity factor. And you hear a lot of acronyms and a lot of EAF and an E4, that type of stuff we're going to show you, but this really is the driver. It's a measure of how often the electric generator runs for a specific period of time. It indicates how much electricity a generator actually produces relative to the maximum it could produce at the continuous full uh, power operation during the same period. And so it's really telling you the measurement of, of what we're getting out of that plant uh, at the time. And you'll see uh, July 2013 versus July 2014. Um, there's been improvement, um, but we're not happy with, with, with that improvement right now. It's not good enough for us right now. And we'll talk about that. Um, this gives you, and I, I mentioned EAF, and it's the uh, equivalent availability factor and that's it, is how many hours is those units capable of running? Um, not that they will run that time because they are dispatched in the market, but it's how m is that unit capable of operating and, and, and how, many, how many megawatts? And so that EAF is a measurement as well as the E4 is a f equivalent forced outage. That is an outage that you didn't plan. It was a human trip. It was equipment failure or something like that, but that is a outage that's unexpected. And so those are the measurements that uh, we incentivize this plan at. In fact, if you look at our, our, our uh, compensation for both the mine as well as the plant itself, the, uh, they have a base compensation, but every one of those employees is, is incentived to meet the equivalent availability factor as well as a, a forced outage factor. So we, we, and safety and some other environmental measurements as well. But if you look at the uh, bar chart, and I think what's really important is the bottom. It's the uh, August of 2014. The uh, EAF's about 68%. The E4 is 32%. I will tell you that um, the E4 is a little bit distorted because of where we're at with the plant, but what a good E4, and correct me if I'm wrong, Randy, but when this plant is running the way it should be is, is at, at that 5% level. That's correct. Okay, so we have, we have a lot of work, but these folks will explain that a little bit. Year to date this year um, is, uh, we've had uh, a, a little bit less on the forced outage, but we had some outages that uh, were, were major outages, uh, and that adds to that factor. But, uh, and then if you look at the aggregate commercial year to date, um, you'll see that the E4 is 25.63 and the EAF is 65.29%. So, and then the starts and stops is very critical too. Uh, we don't want a lot of starts and stops on, this, on these units. That's, that's another measurement. So we know we have a problem, okay? Um, these, th I would say that from an owner's perspective, we shouldn't think that this project would have come to 85% availability within the first year. That's just not normal. Um, we're under a, a, a spotlight. Um, we're, we have open records and stuff like that so people can see what our, our plant's doing. A lot of investor owns have these same type of issues. I'm not saying at this, this level, 
but uh, we just don't see them because they're investor owns or they're independent power producers, so they don't have the to disclose those type of things. But we're working on this. This, this is nothing that we're we're proud of, but but it's it's the measurement of what it is today. Um, what we want to do is talk a little bit. And I'm going to let uh, these folks talk about it. Is what we looked at in next year, our 2015 budget, as well as the 10-year budget out. And um, I will tell you, we spent a lot of time. This is really a budget put together by uh, the new leadership uh, and the owners. Um, and it's going to talk about, and we're going to show this, we're going to talk about the boxes there, is the startup in 12, the shakedown period in 2013, 2014, um, the, the 2015, 16, 17, and where we think we'll be uh, equivalent-wise in our approach on this. I want to I, I want to say that uh, the one thing that I want to stress to all of you in here, because I think it's important because we wanted new leadership, we don't believe that we were having realistic approaches to some of the goals that we were trying to set. And I will tell you, I wouldn't be up here today talking to you today if I didn't think that our team back here can't meet those goals and the owners won't support them. So I want to get uh, Randy, why don't you uh, come on up and PK can talk, you both can talk and share share the comments on these boxes. Okay. As you can see in that first box there in the startup shakedown period, which we are currently in the 2013 to 2014 period, uh, the lost megawatt hours mitigated. What that is when we have a lost megawatts, we want to know why. We do an analysis of why that happened and, and we put plans in place to mitigate it so they don't occur again. Um, we always want to take care of it, get rid of it, get that issue taken care of and get our production up. Um, the next item, I'm going to skip over and let PK talk about that in a minute. Um, the third item is the outage and reliability and maintenance costs. Uh, not only the outages take away the megawatts out of, out of the market, but they all also cost a lot of dollars to make the repairs. So anything you can do, we can do to increase that reliability are going to help you twofold. One in the increase in megawatt hours and also in the reliability costs. Uh, the fourth item is the boiler asset protection. We, we want to protect our asset. That boiler is, is one of our uh, big pieces of that plant, and we cannot let that deteriorate. So we, we do uh, detailed inspections during uh, scheduled outages, and we see if there's any weak points or places that there's corrosion or erosion going on that, that uh, we weren't aware of, and we'll, we'll spend our dollars on that area that will reduce the force outages in the future. Uh, the second to last item is boiler combustion tuning. Uh, when, we, when you burn coal, you want to burn out and get all the energy out of the, out of the coal that you can, and you also want it to burn clean for uh, our uh, emissions control. So we're, we've hired experts in the area, and they've come in and, and tuned our boilers and our mills. And it's a constant um, surveillance on, on the mills and the boilers. You're always making adjustments. And the last item there is absorber gas flow. That's on our, our uh, pollution control devices, and, and that's to monitor our, our pressure drops across that and make sure they're optimized. I'll let PK talk to the flex mine labor. Yes. Th uh, first, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and speak to all of you and for all of the constituents that have uh, been a part of the Prairie State Project. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, especially from the mine perspective, to build a world-class operation. Uh, we believe that we've built, built uh, the best in the country, and uh, we're going we're gonna to hold to that. Um, really, we talked about the startup activities and around shakedown. The flexing of the labor, the, the flexing of the labor, really what that means is, is because as the power plant builds up, we have an infrastructure in place and we're prepared to meet the six and a half to seven million tons of production needed when the plant is fully reliable and up and operating. But during that time period, being cognizant of that, we've also taken that opportunity to watch the price, the costs associated with the mine, and so we flex the labor. That means we have a significant portion of the Prairie State labor hired, but we also keep uh, an abundant number of pr uh, contract labor in place that we can flex up and down based on the reliability so that we're not obviously spending your money uh, fruitlessly uh, when we're building, when we're going forward with the, uh, with the project. Uh, uh, really, uh, the uh, R&M costs, I know we talked about that for the, uh, for the power plant, but those are associated also with, with the mine and, of course, us watching very closely uh, those, those costs and, and what's going on at the mine on a very regular basis. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll move my portion of the stabilizing operations since I'm here. <coughs> Although we are positioned very well at this point 
and have been as reliability improves at the plant. We're not just sitting back and just taking that as that's acceptable. We've taken on some other strategic initiatives at the mine. We call it a mine enhancement plan. From a reliability program that we have internally with the Prairie State employees and a reliability program that we have with a partnership with one of our major suppliers, we identified some shortcomings in, in our producti productivity act production activities. In saying that, we're, we've made some minor adjustments to go ahead and show a 20 to 30 percent improvement in our uh, feet per MMU shift or feet per mine machine shift uh, in this upcoming year. And we're currently putting those pieces in place to be well prepared moving into 2015 as the plant moves to its full reliability. Secondary mining, uh, for some of you that have been around through this project, but really what I'd like to say about the secondary mining is that we had a plan in place when we started this mine using some of the key areas being mined around Prairie State and some other mines that were active. Through that process, we had to go through some requirements, regulatory requirements, and uh, there were some changes to the plans that were forced upon us. That being said, we, we took the initiative to come up with a secondary plan to be able to try to take a little bit of coal off of the pillars as we, we pull back out of what we call our panels. What that means to the ownership and what that means, uh, again, to all of you as constituents, is to be able, the ability to extend the life of the operation, uh, extend the life of the operation by, uh, and when I say operation, the reserve life of the operation by another year, and also to give some very pure coal product into the power plant, because again, when we talk about reliability, and, and I'm sure Randy will talk about it, and the boilers, the, be the better the coal we can give to the power plant, the better those boilers are going to operate, and we know that. At Prairie State, at the mine, safety is the core value. That is one of the number one core value. What comes after safety is quality, and that's quality of workmanship and quality of product. We've got to get the best quality product into that plant, and that's what's secondary mining. Four quadrant mining, really, if you just looked at the overall mine layout of five miles by seven miles of reserves that you all uh, currently control and own for that 30-year period, we looked at that and we have a lot of construction activities. Think about your, your house and your plumbing system. Water goes in and water comes out. Same thing with air going into mine and air coming out. And by looking at that system, we're, we've been able to come up with a new plan with some new sets of eyes, with some technical people looking at it, that we're going to be able to reduce those construction costs going forward starting about mid-2015. So we're going to see some opportunities with that, with that project going forward. And, and again, I, I, I mentioned safety, but safety is the core value of the project. Safety is where we keep our focus, and, uh, and we have an outstanding, and you've allowed us to put together an outstanding workforce at Prairie State. So if you want to you know, pick that up from here, Randy. Sure. Um, the last bullet there, the mission critical projects, reliability driven. What we do is w the capital dollars that we're looking for the owner's approval to go forward are those items that improve the plant reliability. Those are the items that, that, uh, that the owners are interested in, and we're interested in to get the plant reliable. Uh, so that's the stabilizing operations from 15 to 17, and then once we get past that point, 18 to, to 24, we've got just the performance where we've, we've been in the business for long enough. We know what, our, our, what it takes as far as costs, manpower, our, our uh, workforce, will, the learning curve will be past us at that point, um, and it's just day-to-day -day operations. Um, so we've got our leverage safe and well-trained workforce, stable fuel supply. Uh, one of the things that attracted me to Prairie State was the setup there. We've got the Mine Mouth plant right across the street. There is no um, transportation risk or, or risk from other entities. We have total control over that fuel supply. And uh, next item is preventive maintenance programs. That's fully developing all the maintenance programs so we're taking care of our equipment in proper ways, doing the oil changes, those type of things, just like on your car, the, the tire rotations, oil changes and such. So that's, power plant has the same type of things. Outage scheduling, that's our planned outages. We've learned where the weak points are that maybe there's some wear uh, items in, in the plant. So that's where we've got our outage schedules optimized so we know exactly when we need to replace certain components. Uh, the coal, coal combustion residual strategy, the ash from, from the plant. Uh, we've got a near field landfill right there on the plant site and that, that is where we've landfilled our ash. So that, that's our strategy. Um, we have another uh, landfill a little further away but the near field has, has saved us a significant amount of money there. Predictable performance and costs. 
that's where it's known our our forecast and our projections will have a, a good history and where we can predict going forward. Um, what we want to kind of show is a couple charts too, and this is the average delivered fuel prices to electric power plants. Um, and this is EIA data, and it shows the uh, coal, the natural gas, and, and where Prairie State is uh, from a from a fuel perspective. And I, I, I will tell you, we we got in this project because of the cheap fuel, and it was a mine mouth plant, so your fuel is fixed going forward. Uh, you don't have transportation impacts, um, and that's one of the big drivers of this. With this fuel, though, as we talk, we're going to talk a little bit. There are things about this fuel that that is is got to be watched when you burn it. It's very abrasive. It's got high silica, high ash, and so those are things that we knew going in, but they they need to be troubleshoot. Uh, you have to troubleshoot them as you go through the plant. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the average annual mine mouth uh, coal prices, and these are again EIA data. Uh, the U.S. average is shown in the purple, and Prairie State is shown in in the green. And so you'll see the significant advantage of, of the fuel itself. And um, I'm, I'm not sure um, what the big delta is, but uh, these are these are data put together by by the uh, uh, federal government. Uh, the other thing on Prairie State fuel advantage, uh, we're looking at 23 industry actuals, and Powder River Basin is is out in Wyoming. It's surface mine. Illinois Basin obviously is in our area. Northern Appalachia is more of your West Virginia and your, your uh, Kentucky um, areas. And you'll see the significant difference in the dollars in MMBTU. Our BTU content isn't the highest, but it's uh, when you look at it from the effective uh, dollars per MMBTU, it's the most attractive. Um, this is going to give you a snapshot, and I'm going to let uh, Randy walk through this. but. Um, the first one on top will show you what we're projecting for 2015, and then the bottom is 2015 through the 10-year snapshot going forward. And, I, and I'll let Randy and, and PK talk a little bit of how we developed this. You're going to notice it says July 9th of 2014, and you're going to see it says August 13th of 2014. That is a lot of work by Prairie State staff with uh, the owners put together a what we call a expert team. Uh, AMP has several people that have coal experience, especially on combustion, Jay Bartlett, Southern Illinois, and they put, we put together what we call an internal team to work with these folks to come back with a realistic schedule. So that's what you see the difference in when we started in July and what we ended up in August that the, uh, the board approved. And uh, there were several iterations between that, but that, that's what, uh, and we'll, I'll let them talk about how we shifted some, some outage work as well, uh, trying to be able to give, deliver a better product, economic product, and reliable product uh, to you now and, and put some of the uh, outage work uh, off to the end. So, Randy, I'll let you start. You'll see in that top table uh, the July 9th, projections for equivalent availability factor was 81.9 percent which we felt was a realistic number with our outages outage estimates for forced and our scheduled outages that we had planned and the e4 forced outage rate at eight uh, percent net capacity factor of 77.8 percent and again the difference between the equivalent availability and the top number 81.9 and the net capacity factor is roughly about 5%, and that's typical. Uh, the difference between those two is the, the, the t time that the, the plant just isn't in the market, the market price has dipped, and uh, so that's why the capacity factor is a little below what it could have been because uh, the plant was available. Uh, and then the net megawatt hours generated there at 11 uh, million. And then what we did is we challenged ourselves, what can we do to, to reduce costs, increase megawatts. And what we ended up doing, we had two scheduled outages in 2015, and we actually, one in the fall and one in the spring, and, and we determined that we could uh, postpone the one in the, in the fall till the spring of 2016, and we really scrutinized, is that the smart thing to do? Um, look, what components are we planning work on on the unit during that period? And we felt pretty confident that we could push it off till the next spring. Uh, for that, we got an equivalent availability factor rise up to 84.7, and also the E4 rate 
uh, is a little bit higher, 8.9, because you're not doing that work. We felt there's a little bit of risk in there that you may have a, an increase in forced outage rates. So we, we, we estimated that number to be increased a little bit. And the net capacity factor also increased along with the equipment availability. With that risk, we decided we also have a shorter outage. We decided on that unit in the spring because we wanted to make sure that we have a corrosion issue uh, in our boiler that we mitigated but we want to make sure that there's not something surprising to us. So in that spring of 15, we're going to go ahead and get that unit that we're postponing the outage. We're going to do some critical inspections just to make sure that there's not anything going on that is unexpected. And then on the out years from 2015 to 2024, we also adjusted the plans and some outage durations. And you can see the equipment availability, excuse me, availability factor increased from 86.2 to 86.6. And the E4 rates are close to that 5% target. They're 5.9 and 5.8. And the net capacity factor at 82% going forward. I want to go back one slide, uh, Randy, and, and I'll, I'll, the two, I guess, several slides. Uh, I want to go back to that stabilizing operations when you look at 2015 to 2017. What do you mean by that? There are a lot of things that we will be doing redundancy. We found out that, boy, if a valve went out, it wasn't built for redundancy. So down the road, it's going to take us a while. We don't want to take outages just to do redundancy. We think we have confidence we're going to prioritize them. But some of that work's going to take that, that long. So that's why you're seeing those dates right there, OK? That, that's why we separate the stabilizing. There's a lot of little things that we'd like to do um, from that perspective. So um, we're, we're trying to find that also. We're finding out a lot of the, the uh, issues we're having, as, as Randy said, they're not boiler related. We got into that 18 month of, of uh, operation, and we found out that the bearings that we thought were in some of the, say, the conveyors underneath the surface flight conveyors handling the ash and stuff out of the boilers, we thought they had an 18 month life. We found out they didn't. So we're going to a 12 month life on the bearings because of that. And what we're saying is if that plant outage comes, and it's only nine months, you're replacing those bearings anyways because we do want to get the eight, you know, get the 12 months out of it. So we're being a lot more proactive, but we're finding out that's where we're finding our stabilization. We're finding issues as we get out there in those years. Randy, do you have any comments on that? No, and that's, that's one of the things in our outages that we've had recently in August especially. Um, that stabilizing effort or that, or that shakedown period. We had some longer outages early in the life of the, of the units that prevented us from your normal shakedown periods. And then that's kind of what we're going through now is in August, we had several outages, but the good thing was, in my, my view anyway, was they're all different things. So those are things that you can put plans in place to mitigate them. And then the next thing happened. And now we are also looking at uh, the single point of failure type I items that uh, Mark mentioned. So we're trying to proactively catch these things before they happen also. Uh, we also put uh, in one of the earlier slides some uh, alarms in place. So as we've had thousands and thousands of points that we use to monitor the equipment. Well, we have alarms, but before the alarms, we put a system in that as a, as a point trends up, it alerts you. There may be a problem, there may not be, but at least it gets you looking at it before something happens that forces a piece of equipment off offline and you can do something about it ahead of time to keep the plan available. So we're putting those pl plans in place, but that's what I wanted to leave you is that shakedown period. We're still going through it, but the good thing is it's, it's a lot of different items. We're, we'll get through that and we're also turning the units around a lot faster too. When it comes down, we're getting the unit back online to get it back into production quicker as, as we learn how to operate better all the time. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that uh, we felt as we made the change um, that we didn't feel like when we did have an outage, there was as much urgency as, as owners wanted. So I think uh, the team we got here recognizes that. This slide here is, is really a 10-year. We, we, we showed you that in an average. But if you want to look at the detail on the bottom, it goes from 2015 to 2024, and it shows you your EAF as well as your forced outage rates. And you'll see where we're trending down to that 5%. Um, you know, it, for us to put there and say we're going to be at 5% in 2015, 2016, I, I just, we, we don't think that's realistic right now. Uh, we think those numbers are achievable. 
We wouldn't be here and giving them to you if we didn't think they were. Um, we put a lot of time in that. Um, this shows the, and I'm going to let PK talk about this one. This is his bread and butter, actually. I think what you can what you can see overall here is, is again, uh, we have a pretty big infrastructure there. So that infrastructure is designed to produce that six and a half million tons, the seven million tons, for that 1,600 megawatt plant to to produce power for for the year. What, what you can see is we're driven we're driven with that infrastructure by tons. When we produce the tons, we get the cost. And when, when the power plant has run at those levels that, and for, there's been months that that's occurred, when they run at those levels and we produce the 500 to 550,000 tons of coal, we see those numbers consistent as what we show you up here. So again, when you look at the, not just going forward, that consistent fuel cost is, uh, is, is achievable. And not only is it achievable, we're, again, we're just not accepting achievable, we're looking for every opportunity to drive that down. Uh, we don't consider ourselves uh, acceptable until, uh, until we find the best, the best reli uh, reliability of the operation and getting that cost down, and we'll continue to do that. And as I mentioned, some of those initiatives early, uh, early on. But, but again, uh, uh, I think just what it shows you here is, is that the consistent cost of the fuel going forward, and, uh, and we sincerely believe we, we can achieve that and have done it in periods of time when we, when we had to do it. One of the things, too, I would show on this is the, the amount of time the coal is on the ground is a big deal, especially with moisture. Um, and so, PK, you can see the fluctuation here. We need, to, we need to stabilize that production. And when we get to the 85 percent, the 80 percent, PK's got an easier job because that, that coal's coming out per ton per hour is consistent. Uh, we, had, we normally plan for 800 to 900,000 tons of coal whether it's at the mine or at the plant. At one point, we were at 1.3 because we thought two units were coming on. We ramped up the production. It went down. We, we wanted to protect our, our uh, labor force, so we had a lot of coal on the ground. Over the Labor Day, that causes you problems if you have a lot of rain. We tried to save some overtime, kept the mine, miners off that Labor Day. We had a lot of rain. We couldn't blend some of that quality dry coal with the wet coal that was on the ground. It, it, it doesn't work as well in the boilers and, and all your feed hoppers and stuff. And so we had to have a D-rate. They're figuring out, they're checking the weather, they're making sure that everything, those are things that are lessons learned. But it's uh, the significance of the coal is, the coal is, is, is within spec, okay? But it does matter how much coal is on the ground and how wet it is and how you use it and blend it from that perspective. So um, I think that's, Mayor, that's it. Um, we, I guess, I guess you got questions? Well, I'm going to ask Dave. Okay. I think you've got someone else to introduce, Dave. Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to introduce Rick Soderholm. Rick is the original engineer on this project. Started way back in 2002 or three. You know, we first started looking at getting into a, a, a coal project such as Prairie State. And of course, Rick uh, wrote the engineer's report. Uh, that you need to have when you go to Wall Street to get your financing for a plant of this size. So uh, Rick's been involved with it. He's crunched the numbers for years. And, uh, and so he's our expert that we look to when we have questions about cost, uh, rates, uh, differentials, projections. And so I'm going to ask Rick to come up here and uh, give you a brief report. Good evening, and nice to be here. Yeah, as uh, Dave said, uh, the, the, the proper pronunciation of our company name now is Lidos, but uh, for years it was R.W. Beck. You may have heard of us. Uh, this is my 35th year with the accommodation of those two people. Uh, I, too, had different color hair when I started. But in the interest of time, um, I, I just want to wrap up everything. As Dave said, I've been involved with this a long time. I've been involved in the markets a long time in this part of the country uh, exclusively. I understand uh, fairly well what's going on here. And, Mayor, you, you opened very well. Uh, electricity is very high cost right now. Um, I've also seen a lot of publications, a lot of press, uh, a lot of media reports that compare Paducah with others. Uh, 
Uh, I haven't seen them all, but I will say, you know, some of that information is accurate, some of it is not. I don't want to get into that other than to recognize that, yeah, your rates are higher than they should be. Um, and I want to talk about, uh, again, in the interest of time, uh, two things. One is how we can get those rates down, and two, what it's going to look like going forward. And I don't mean 20 years forward, I mean two or three years forward. Um, first thing, as you just heard, uh, I've been involved with Prairie State since the beginning. <clears throat> and I know that they're making every effort to keep costs down. Um, that's an ongoing thing. Um, it, in everything I read, uh, I thought this quote summed it up very well. And I'm going to change a word when I read it. The reality is this. When Prairie State's strategy succeeds, it will prove to be a wise decision. Um, not if, because I'm convinced uh, that everything Prairie State's management and staff is doing, that it will operate as designed. And when that happens, your rates that you pay are based on Paducah's costs. The thing that's getting you lately is the power cost adjustment. Okay. Now, Prairie State's not the only thing that affects the power cost adjustment, but it's the majority of things. So, and I'm not predicting, I don't have any pro projections for you um, as to actual how low we think your rates could go or when, but I'm very certain that you're at the top of the crest. Okay. Now, will that power cost ever go away, or go all the way down to zero? That's the goal. Okay. That's the goal, and that's what everybody is working for. We think it's achievable, not only with Prairie State uh, operating more reliably, but other things that Kempa in particular is doing, Paducah is doing. Uh, to give you some examples, uh, Kempa, I work for Kempa as well. Uh, we are preparing ourselves to refinance their debt, the, the 2007 debt, which is a considerable chunk. Take advantage of today's interest rates. That savings and interest will pass through directly to you. Uh, when they may, that may happen, uh, I'm guessing probably next year, uh, maybe 2016, who knows? Depends on the market. Uh, Paducah is looking to optimize its peaking and, and its uh, purchase power uh, operations. So is Kempa. Uh, all of these things point toward a downward trend in Paducah's rates. Okay, now I don't have an estimate. It depends on so many things, uh, but we're certain uh, that the the pressure on rates is downward in this system. Uh, now, again, I don't want to get into a comparison uh, specifically with your neighbors, but a lot has been written about, you know, you're 50% higher than JP or 60% or higher than KU. I'm not going to argue with the number, but you are higher. But what is going to uh, impact your relative competitiveness going forward? And very quickly, you've heard a lot about fuel price. Um, this is the driving force behind the benefit to you of Prairie State. <clears throat> and it, for those of you who can't see that, uh, the two big uh, columns are diesel and fuel oil, which really do doesn't affect you. Natural gas is next. Uh, coal prices, the, I get the information from the same place. And the, the last two, uh, the next to the last bar is, uh, PK showed you a graph of Prairie State's production cost, which is $1.10. We're right on the, in line with that, thankfully. The dollar thirty-two takes into account what you paid to buy the coal and develop the mine. Okay, so it includes debt service and reserve costs. That is, in my mind, the, the true comparison of a delivered fuel price versus a production cost at the mine. And you can see it's a, a what a, a third or so of the cost of natural gas. But the benefit going forward to Paducah is that that's not going to change much. There's going to be some in inflationary impacts. Uh, PK has shown that through production improvements, he can offset that once the plant starts uh, operating reliably. So this is a big thing. Uh, and we're convinced, all of our projections have shown, and some of you have seen them, that going forward, your rates are going to be very, very stable. And this is one of the main reasons. And I can tell you back in 2004, this stable, reliable power was a goal of Paducah Power. And this is one w way to achieve it. Other impacts, environmental regulations. Uh, you didn't talk much about the, the back end of this power plant, but it is fully compliant, obviously, with all current regulations. It has seven different control systems on it. It's compliant with, I believe, most of the future regulations that we know about. So your exposure to this topic is basically zero. If you look around you, uh, TVA, for example, is spending billions of dollars, <clears throat> and KU is as well, to comply with the regulations that are coming. 
you don't have that risk. Aging resources and replacement capacity. Obviously, this plant is brand new. Um, TVA, for example, just retired 14 coal units. KU is about to do the same thing. All of that is going to make their rates go up. Uh, TVA's budget for, for the next few years is $10 billion in new construction. And finally, load retention. Uh, TVA lost a big load. Big Rivers, as I'm sure many of you know, lost two smelters. They had a, a very large rate increase recently. They have another one pending. So what we're seeing here is downward pressure on Paducah, upward pressure on your neighbors, which will only help your competitive position. Uh, will it make you the lowest in the, in the state? No. Will it make you competitive going forward? Uh, we believe so. And finally, what does Paducah Power have to offer? <clears throat> I, I read a question that was raised. You know, you, you can offer incentive rates, but what do you do after the incentive period runs out? Well, here's what you have, just to recap. All of your resources are brand new. Your peaking plant, they've all been built in this decade. They're all environmentally compliant. Again, the known fuel source. You don't have to worry about transportation. You don't have to worry about market prices. And we know what it's going to cost. There are two interconnections in this community, one to TVA and one to KU. Uh, that's very rare. You have in-town backup generation, as you know. So to a potential industry, reliability is often as important or more important than price. Yet you have that to offer. Again, once things stabilize, we believe you will have competitive, maybe not the lowest, but certainly the gap is closing. Uh, now I know that doesn't do anything to to to, to, <clears throat> to correct <clears throat> excuse me to correct what you paid in the winter. You know I don't like my rates. I live in Indiana, uh, in Indianapolis, and I could tell you what I pay for electricity is about seven cents. Okay, we don't like it either, and in the winter time I used a lot of electricity, but you know but ours are going to go up. We know it. Yours I believe are going to come down. How low? Uh, it's very hard to say, but we're all working to, to make that happen. Um, and this is what I believe you have to offer to, to your residents. And once we get through the shakedown period, I think it'll happen. And finally, little exposure to future rates. I don't see Paducah building anything uh, or retiring anything or changing its fuel source for the next 30 years. I mean, you're there. We just got to get through it, and uh, we're, we're very... Uh, Confident that, that a stable rate, residential rate, is in your future, and we're working hard to get to that point. So, thank you for your time. That concludes. Uh, Mayor, I think that pretty much concludes. I think uh, uh, Chairman Roberts might have a couple of words to wrap things up, but otherwise, are there any questions from the commissioners that we could uh, address at this time? Does, uh, does Chairman Roberts want to speak first, then we'll have some questions. I wanted to thank Prairie State for the presentation. It's nice to hear some good news from, for a while from Prairie State. The, my position with the, or our position, I should say, with the board here is, as I said at the meeting yesterday, we're looking for Prairie State to sell itself to us again and this is this is the first shot thank you okay um, I've got I've got a few questions um, mainly direct to direct toward Prairie State and okay um, you know Rick you talked you talked about uh, TVA and Paducah Power Rick right yeah TVA and Paducah Power, and the big difference between TVA and Paducah Power is Paducah Power has about 25,000 ratepayers, right, right around there. How many? 23,000. 23,000 ratepayers. Uh, TVA has several million ratepayers. So the cost to our ratepayers is significantly higher per person than TVA debt service. So uh, ours, you know, are paying about 30,000 per person in debt service. TVA about three. So what, 
What do you say to that? Uh, that that's certainly true, uh, the concept of, of, that, of that statement. On the, on the flip side, I, I would say that TVA rate payers are paying a lot more for fuel than you're paying for fuel. Um, and again, again, without getting into some specifics, TVA just announced a rate increase that goes into effect next week. And if you look at what other distributors in this area are paying, what their base electric rates are, they're very, very comparable to what Paducah's are if the PCA goes away. So it's very complicated how you take costs and allocate them, and it has to do with a lot of things. But we're showing TVA, you, you, you should be very competitive with where you would have been in a very short time, provided we can get that PCA to go down. And then going forward, we think it's going to stay there. We can't say the same. They're, they're looking at another 10, 10 billion in either debt or rate relief or rate raising to pay for what they need to do just to keep running. So, but yes, I, I understand the, the point. And you know, as I used to tell my daughter, I don't care what your friends are doing. I only care what you're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the way I feel about our situation here in Paducah. I don't care what TVA is doing. I only care what's happening here in Paducah to our ratepayers. And you all have to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Understood. And I heard you talk a lot about ways to operate uh, at cost savings to Bury State. But I didn't really hear you say much about saving our ratepayers money. You know, maybe in a couple of years, maybe in three years. Um, but is the plant set at full load to run at full load or is it being uh, cycled to handle less than the base load? That's as one the, of my as questions. As estimates showed on the net capacity factor and the equivalent availability factor, that 5% different, that's the 5% where we're not at. We're at full capability except for that 5 And that's usually, you know, in the off-peak period, which is midnight to 6 a.m. is the off-peak. So that's your typical down. But otherwise, unless there's an equipment issue, we're running at full load. And probably most of the people here in the audience are like me. They're civilians. You know, they don't really know all the technical part. I uh, understand all of it. It's, um, I've, I've had to learn a lot in a short time. But tell me about the issues of the ash sticking to the boilers. I hear, that, I hear about that a lot. Tell me about that. Well, the coal we burn is unwashed and it has a high ash content. So there, there's a large volume of ash along with the coal that goes through the boiler. And when it's in there, it's, it sticks to the surfaces called slag or fouling. And we have devices called soot blowers that, that run into the boiler and knock that slag off and then into hoppers where we collect it and, and dispose of it. Um, when and the initial design of the boiler didn't have all the soot blowers necessary and we've installed additional soot blowers in areas to keep it clean and that's been a success so far one of the a lot of the outages early on were, were actually caused by some of these soot blowing devices because of the steam that's used to clean off the surfaces it had too much water in it mm -hmm. and it actually eroded the tube along with knocking the ash off we've since made a modification uh, and pulled steam off from a different source which should mitigate that erosion and uh, reduce our forced outages, especially due to the soot blower erosion, and also keeping the tubes clean. So that's kind of one of those learning curves that we've went through. Mm -hmm. I, I would say too that um, at one point we will put more observation ports in so we could see what was going on inside the boiler as well as um, some, some cameras. So we're trying to look at that because the, the, the ash content and, and the coal itself we knew that there was going to be high ash but we're dealing with a lot a little bit higher ash than we had ex es estimated from day one so we're looking at ways of how we get better quality blend that coal because uh, we're working off of a, an old pile too so a lot of that's affecting us as we go forward too so i mean we we've learned a lot with soot blowers we've we've put inspection ports in um i th i think we're finally getting that where you tune a boiler and you get optimal combustion and then you got your soot blowers working, you got good water chemistry, all that has to come together. Uh, and if one of them's out of line, if the, soot, if the, the steam quality's not there, you, get, you, you can get corrosion and erosion in your boiler. So, and that's coming from a novice. But uh, so we are, we're, we're, we've made a lot of those improvements already. It's just tweaking and getting better knowledge and, and better understanding of those things. Okay, and do, uh, does Prairie State report to NERC with a GAD report? 
Do you do that annually? Yes, we do. Okay. And uh, we can get that annual report? It's, it's public information. Okay. And um, what has been the change in the power of production cost? And you may have had it on your report, but... I, I guess I'm in other words like a financial pro, pro forma what's how, been the how has it materialized compared to what was projected I mean um, I guess the well it, it depends on when you were looking at the projection um, I think if you look at the, the cost of the plant when we, we took it over um, I think if it was I mean basically um, it's, it's tough to, to, to tell you that because, what well, I'll put it in perspective. The first year, about a first year, the first 18 months, that plant should run at 77%, okay, a capacity factor. That's a national average, okay, depending on the plant, the size of the plant. A lot of that can change, but that's, that's, that's a trend. We weren't there. I showed you those screens that were 67% in 14 or 13. So we were underperforming there, okay? The, you would never get to, if we forecasted 85%, that's a bad forecast. That No plant, no coal plant, no new coal plant is going to reach 85% that first 12 to 18 months. It just takes time to get through some of these bugs. So um, I would tell you, you're probably... I, 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 I got to be careful here because I'm not sure I know the number. I can, we can give you that, okay? It's, uh, but that's, that's what you got to look at is when should it been performing at, at 85? And then, you know, that should be about this time or about six months later, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be in 15. So, um, well, so it's probably 30 bucks, okay? With the contract that we have with Prairie State, even at 85%, it's not going to really give us a lot of relief. That's Mayor, that could get the uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what your adjustment and our rate schedules uh, very close to zero. Uh, I consider 85 percent. If A is excellent, B, C, D, E, uh, 85 percent to me. If the plan operates there, that, that's a D. But if we can get a D, uh, Rick Soderholm has done our our budget numbers, mm -hmm. and uh, that should bring in a, a PCA close to zero. So we don't have far to go to get there, and I want to emphasize that, you know. If we can get up to the A level, we'll probably be talking about cutting rates. Do you all ever see that happening, getting it up to an A rating? I, I believe we can get In other words, can we get up to a 90% plus hmm. plant availability factor? Our, in, in the slideshow, I had our projections factors. There are projections in there. Um, I think our, I'd have to go back and look, but I think our highest was in the 80s as far as equivalent availability factor. Okay. When this. Um, and we'll, Commissioners, you go just ahead. go around and okay. we'll start with you, Commissioner right. Abraham. So when this was marketed out to uh, municipals, uh, you, you talked about the 85% the, the getting the, the facility up. Uh, I'm just a. Common sense in China, trying to figure this out. I'm pretty sure that's where it was marketed. I mean, if you're coming to me and you're telling me that if I, if I come in with you boys, that this plant's going to operate at 85 percent capacity, therefore my rates for my uh, for my constituents will be low. I mean, or did you say, well, if you come with me in about five years, those rates will be where you can offer a savings to your, to your, but it's going to take us about five years to get that up. It, it, the individual owners did their own review and performance, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, what so you my guys question did. is to the wrong fellow. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, uh, yeah, Mark is absolutely right. Uh, I'm not sure what was marketed to Paducah initially. Who, I, who did the marketing? Peabody. Is Peabody in the house? Are they here? No. no. But I do know that what once Paducah decided to review participation in the project, they brought in folks like us. Uh, Mark did the same thing. 
Uh, every owner did the same thing. And we uh, assigned our own expected long-term availability factors to our analysis. It, and it was always, as Mark said, always lower in the first year or two. Uh, was it five years to get there? No. I don't remember the numbers, but this has taken longer than we ex expected based well, on our experience in the industry. Well, maybe my question is for Mr. Clark. Pardon me. Mr. Clark, maybe you can answer that question. Okay. Same question. As I recall, when we, we went into this project, uh, you know, things have changed. Two things changed fundamentally since the project was started in construction in the fall of uh, 2007. It took about six years. Number one, you had the advent of fracked gas come on big time, which just stood the wholesale power markets on its head. And two, you had the economy melt down. We had the biggest economic recession since the Great Depression. Six and a half million people lost their jobs. Uh, we're still not out of it yet as far as I'm concerned. But uh, as far as this plant goes, we originally had a projection that when we, we come on and we got through the shakedown phase, we would have rates that would be competitive with our former power supplier, TVA. That was our goal. We never said we're going to be cheaper, but we wanted to be competitive with them. That means you get within just a few percentage points. You may be 2 3% higher or 2 3% lower. You're considered competitive. So you figured what? How, many, how long would it take? Did, did that? Well, we figured we'd be there now, but unfortunately, as, as you've heard these gentlemen say, we've been on this plant working on it for two years, and we're still not quite there yet. I'm hopeful maybe in the coming months that we'll make some good progress. I have some more questions, but I don't want to monopolize it right now. Any you guys? Commissioner Gall, do you want to just take it around the table? <clears throat> well, M Mr. Clark, one of the things I continually hear is now that the rates are where they are, what are you doing to cost cut measures so that they won't continue to go up? If the plant doesn't start operating, what what can we do? Where are we now? Um, and I, that that's a difficult question. You know, I'm we we did an analysis that if we if we cut everyone's salary to zero and gave them no benefits, how much would that cut our budget? And it was less than nine percent because all of our budget just about is, is wholesale power costs. So that's why we're heavily dependent on getting Prairie State, you know, stabilize and get up to at least 85% uh, reliability factor, plant availability, plant availability factor. So does that mean that, that you have no plans to make any cost savings in your own house? Oh, we've made quite a few. Uh, uh, you haven't heard of them. Well, uh, Andrea maybe can answer that because we withdrew a lot. We don't sponsor a lot of events anymore. We're, we've got out of that. Uh, we, we didn't, we suspended our COLA pay for employees uh, this year. Uh, we've cut out a lot of travel unnecessary, you know, that we felt unless there were, it was good training that we needed, uh, you know, it's, uh, we've cut back on travel, but these things are, are drops in the bucket, folks, when you've got to look at the, the cost of wholesale power. I understand that. That's just the nature of the beast. Oh, sorry. There was a significant reduction in overtime and suspended some capital. Need to get the story out. Commissioner Wilson. You, you all said individual owners did their own performance. Perform Pro forma. What was marketed to Paducah? Did you? I still don't have that answer. I didn't market anything to Paducah. <laughs> Peabody Coal did. But I'm asking David what was marketed to PPS. I thought you were talking to the well, end. Well, we, for, for several years before construction was ever started and we pulled the trigger to get into this project, there was development committee meetings uh, that, at, at Peabody's headquarters. And the development committee was uh, the plans, blueprints, you could call it for the plant, were being drawn up. Uh, things were being looked at, cost analyzed, and whatnot. And we paid our ongoing share of those development costs. Uh, originally, the project was going to be owned by Peabody, 53%, and they would control it. 
uh, we would simply maybe when it was under construction go for a tour now and then and they'd hand us our share of the cost and we'd write a check. Uh, they would have control of the project since they're majority owners. Uh, they did change CEOs at Peabody and they decided they didn't want to go into power plant construction so they under the contract they had the right to go down to 10 percent participation which they did so they sold additional shares and uh, Mark I think that's how you got in and, uh, on, on that was uh, Mark's the largest owner having a little over what 22 23 percent well I, let me just cut to the chase though but do you feel like you were misled by no, them no not at all you, you where we are today is where you were led to believe we would be the, oh, no we have set up here the only reason we're not there uh, commissioners for the simple reason we haven't got the plant stabilized we haven't got the reliability up to 85 percent and that's why we're not there but you were you told you would be at 85 percent by this time yes we felt honestly felt we would be at, at the 85 percent. and that's what they told you not Peabody that was our own consultants that was our own do work. you think those consultants misled you no all right and I have a question I'm sorry I don't go ahead <laughs> I'm just saying though if if they told you we would be at 85 percent and we're not we're far from it from what it sounds like it sounds like to me you were misled no not I mean it was put to us no one could guarantee it it's just like you come to me and ask me how much snow we're going to have this December I can't answer that I can say I got enough salt stocked <laughs> up stockpile to handle 90 percent of the contingencies that we may have in December but I can't I just don't know uh, right, they, you, let, me, let me let me shed a little you know I and I'm, I'm speaking in generalities okay so it's not specific Paducah or anything the, the one thing that the uncertainty on any of these projects is is two things you have construction risk in your study and their performer that went that should have been addressed okay now with that said you also have any Peabody anybody looked at this plant knew the national trend was and you looked at the experience that this plant would run at 85 percent or above once it got through the shakedown the commissioning shakedown what I think this plant experienced was a lot of a lot of little moving parts um, I think that the plant uh, from day one um, was managed uh, and, and the, the coal the way we handled the uh, ash we were we were challenged uh, we had more ash than we thought okay um, and you just have to work through that but that caused a lot of problems early on and as we got through it and got smarter we fi figured that out but it took a while um, one of the other things that I, I will tell you that the contract that we had with Bechtel um, it wasn't a bad contract as far as it was a contract but it had a performance 100 hour performance test on each unit okay um, and then they could leave okay well um, that's the contract we we probably um, would have been better off if we could have sustained that project for another f you know two months of operation before we just got rid of them that was something that was in a contract it wasn't illegal it was in a contract nobody foresaw that from an owner's perspective okay um, so uh, you know those are just little things that when you look back I'm just saying I look back and say Boy, I wish I could have done that different. Okay, but but it doesn't mean anybody misled us. Is what I'm trying to say. Was the equipment that was purchased the right equipment for this type of coal? Um, the the only the only p equipment that was purchased that had to technically be modified was the boilers. Mm -hmm. They were uh, bought from TXU. Uh, that's Texas. the manufacturer? Uh, no, that's the utility. TXU is a utility in Texas. Who's the manufacturer? Uh, B&W was the manufacturer. They were set up to burn lignite, which is a different coal. Um, B&W, Burns and Mac, uh, Bechtel and everybody worked through the modifications required to be able to burn this coal. So I would tell you we purchased modified units at a price, a, a, a discounted price. We had to design modification them before we took them and put them in the units. So technically they were designed to handle this coal and this spec. That's the way they were they were uh, redesigned. So They were designed through modification. Would they, they were, be considered used equipment? No, they weren't. They were not used equipment. It was they, the equipment for one cup of coal right. modified to 
address. They were the right size, the right size boilers for our units, and they were modified with the with the uh, approval of B and W, with Burns and Mack as an engineer, with Bechtel looking at it. Okay, and so, you know, they were modified, and they're they're working, but there is things we had to work through. But that would be the only equipment that would be would have been modified. Okay. Can I ask one more? Mm -hmm. You talked about the, the 2.5 million customers that are serviced by Prairie State. Are they all in the same type of situation that we are in Paducah? I don't know how to answer that. I'll take a stab at it. Uh, some of the owners are, uh, are project specific. In other words, for instance, AMP, Mark's organization, when he builds a solar plant or a hydro plant or a Prairie State or a combined cycle plant, they have all of these. They send contracts out and you open them up and you fill out the amount of that plant that you want and you obligate yourself with a take or pay contract to pay for that. And when he gets these done, he goes, gets financing, gets the projects built. So if you're a member and you took too much of a solar plan or a hydro or something you maybe have some financial heartache to get through you know your your, your customer is going to have higher rates uh, some of them are are like tva they're all requirements like the illinois group they're not here this evening but the imea uh, you join they supply all your power and they have a, a variety so you get a kind of a slice of each different project that they're in mm -hmm. and so they get a blended cost there is some protection in that uh, I will grant you uh, when we left TVA we were in such an organization uh, we were responsible for several hundred million dollars of their 30 billion dollar debt and we had no control over it we had no say how it was operated or marketed or anything so that that's the types of organizations. That's how these uh, municipalities and cooperatives uh, handle their, their projects. So I really don't understand if they are or aren't, but I guess it just depends on the community. It, it depends on. I've got 130 communities. I got almost 70 in this project. They're all different. Some took uh, more percentage-wise of their resource. I look at I look at our portfolio and our members as a resource. There's this resource, that resource, this resource, and it just depends on what your appetite for a specific type of resource is. And a lot of that's controlled back home within the communities. Um, and so it, it varies. We, we have certain parameters that we recommend to our members, okay? They have their own consultants. And so we do, uh, when we do our projects, we do a beneficial use analysis for each one of our members to demonstrate that they can use that size of capacity in this project in their portfolio. So everybody does it differently. All right, question. Dave, you brought this up. Explain to me or to the audience to all of us, the difference between take and pay, take or pay, and why of the 230 communities, about 82 are one, one type, and the rest are something else. Why are there two kinds of contracts? What are those kinds of contracts and why you have some who took one and some who took the other. So if you'll start by, wasn't there any, or, or, or whoever wants to jump in, take and pay versus take or pay, and why some communities chose this, not that. Well, in, in public power, I'm, I'm not talking co-ops now because they finance differently, but in public power, to get good rates from the rating agencies and, and investors, you do a take or pay contract. That contract obligates each community the electric, uh, the, uh, the electric systems and the communities to pay for that project regardless if it operates or not. Oh, wait, this is take or pay or take? That's take or, take or pay. Okay. All right? So you're paying for, That's just, you're, you're paying for the plant as well as the generated electricity? You're, you are paying for any debt that is incurred in that project you're obligated to. Plant or electricity? Take and pay means that I have a contract with you, Mayor, and you are only going to pay me for what I produce. So if I'm only paying, if, you know, if I'm only producing so much, you're only buying that many megawatts, okay? That's the difference. So 
So if I get right, so in other words, take or pay means I'm going to buy part of a plant and part of the electricity the plant produces. You get the output from, you buy the plant, you're obligated for all debt retirement, and in turn, you get your share of the electricity produced out of it. Or I could buy, not buy the plant, just buy what the plant produces, i.e. the electricity. Which would be a higher price. Okay. All right. Now, and then my question is, is it of the 230 some odd communities, 82 of them were take and pay in the I, I don't know that for a fact, so I don't, I don't know who they are or what okay. they are. Are they co-ops? But, but, some, but the vast, some took take or, take or pay and some took take and pay. Obviously, the ones that took take and pay where they only are responsible for their electricity only, seems to me like they would have a little less burden because they're not buying part of the plant. Do you want to speak I, to that? I, I, don't, I don't know that for a fact. I, I don't know what that contract said. So somebody had to take the obligation of the debt. Okay. But so it could have been not the community. It could have been the agency or the, the lead person. I, I'm not sure. I can't, I can't answer that. Can anybody answer that? Take or pay or take and pay. Am well, I wrong? Well, Mr. Clark, I mean, what, what contract? We have a take, we have a take or pay. Okay, so fully understanding that if it wasn't producing any, we still got to pay. Still had to pay. You still have to pay because so, you're an owner. Not, you're an equity owner. Which is owner. not uncommon in a public power uh, bond deal. It's not uncommon. So that's what that's what your consultants recommended. But why would? But th they didn't recommend it. That's the only way you can go. I mean, if you're going to go to Wall Street and borrow uh, money from bondholders. They want a secure obligation. They're not going to take, well, if the plant runs well, you will get paid and make money. No, they want to know that they're, they want well, a lead pipe cinch. Well, what I'm saying is if you, you know, you had, I mean, you're not an expert in, in that part of it. No, I'm not. But so you have a person that, that's working with you as your eyes out there. So you got two contracts and you're looking through the contracts and you got one take or pay or take and pay. And you're looking at this guy and he's telling you, well, um, I recommend you go with this one. It didn't, go, it didn't happen that way? No, no. All we had was a take take or pay. There was no. Oh, we, so did, we weren't sure to. Here's your choice. Take. Oh, but there was a choice. There was. The, the choice was. Apparently there take, was. Take or there's, pay. Is there's the an and in there. There's a take and pay and a take or pay. But you're saying you only got, you only, you just took what was given to you. That's the only thing you could do, as he okay. said. That's the only way we could get financing is a take or pay contract. Well, how is it the Illinois Municipal Electric Agency, that's as take and pay as does, well, I mean, some do, some don't. I can, tell, I can answer that because they're, I believe they are all requirements, not project-based. So Illinois, as an agency, takes all their costs for all their resources on everything, and they put it in a basket, and then they divvy out the cost, the average cost out to them, and that's what that, that's why they're doing a take and pay probably. I think okay. IMPA, I, Indiana probably does the same thing. Yes. Okay, there you go. So There's your answer. But it would seem that if you only have to pay for what you need, for electricity no, but, you've contracted but, for. But you gotta go deeper. You gotta see what the obligation of the agency and their ownership is because they are obligated. Because Indiana and Illinois don't have the debt recovery for, through customers. So there is a mechanism that ties them to that debt recovery. It's just called a different thing, that's all. They're structured different. I think I, I've taken a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm not an engineer. I, I, no, I'm just, it, it, you I, have to, you're, you're looking at two different, there's different agencies. And that's my point is that we're looking at two different things, two different types of contracts and I guess I'm surprised. Why would Prairie State have two kinds of contracts? But Prairie State does not have two different contracts. <laughs> no, they don't. Prairie State has one direct contract. They're all the same. Tell me like they got two separate contracts. No, they're not. That's okay. Okay. I mean, Prairie State does not. The individual owners could have different contract structures is what I'm trying to say. Prairie State only has one. We all signed the same contract. Trust me, I was the last one in. Yeah. Okay. And you had to take or pay. Yes. But I was the last one in. I had the same contract that everybody else signed. Right. In fact, I paid a little bit more for the coal. Okay? Okay. 
But that's 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 the difference. I'm just saying. I'm I, no, I, I know I understand, but I, I just want to make sure you understand. It's not Peabody. That contract is the same for all nine owners. Okay. Okay. The different the structure difference you're talking about is between yeah. a certain owners and their members. That could be take or pay or take and pay. It depends on how they're structured. Some agencies are all requirements. And that's the difference. We're not. We sign up individual members for each project. If Illinois gets into a project, all their members are obligated to get in. Okay, they say they're getting in. And they decide to decide what the need is. They can't they can't come out. They gotta be in. That's the difference. All right. Commissioner Gott, you had a question? I did have one question for Mr. Soderholm. Um I, I wrote down that I kind of hung on this you said yes your rates are higher than they should be and very certain we are at the top of the crest I was a little confused about your rates and we and your company Lidos or Lidos engineering mm -hmm. uh, who, who exactly do you and or your company work for who are your contracts with and who are you employed by who's the we and who's the you yeah I miss I misspoke there um, we um, well, we work for KMPA, Paducah Power, and Princeton, okay. as well as obviously many other clients in the, in the region. But but your contract is with KMPA. At one of them is yes. Are, are you contracted with any others in this group? We, they do modeling for us, like Graham. Okay. Stochastic modeling. And, and Paducah as well. And Paducah separately as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we do design work for Paducah, for example, uh, substation work, uh, as well as consulting work, and engin engineering work, so. and same thing for Princeton. Okay. So, yeah, but we have yeah. probably 40,000 clients. <laughs> well, I, you and, know, I was and, just and, trying to figure that out within this group. And now, he doesn't work for us, but the firm does. Other, others within yeah, my firm. The modeling groups. So. Okay. I just want to say I appreciate your presentation and all the charts compiled. I've been trying to follow all the acronyms and all the projections for the future. I appreciate you saying that we're going to get to a stable rate. But to me, a stable rate doesn't mean lower. It just means it's going to be stable, and it could be stable, stable at a high rate. I'm not hearing an answer about what kind of relief we're going to have for our citizens and businesses in Paducah and the other cities that are impacted by this. I, I, I'm not going to talk about what Paducah is going to do for you. I can assure you what Prairie State is trying to do and the owners are trying to do. We, we will get this plant running to where it belongs. From that point, we're, we're going to drive the, mem the ownership, the Prairie State management, to look at ways of keeping driving these costs down or keeping them levelized as markets go up on efficiencies in coal and, and, and even staffing. When we look at this, it's taken a whole lot of staff to get where we're at today. And we'll look at that once we stabilize this thing and we're going forward and we're not spending tons of time trying to do redundancies and, and stabilizing in that 15 period, 16 period of new valves or something. We're gonna look at ways of driving our costs down because we, we think there's, there's optimization there. Uh, so, I don't think we can wait till 15 or 16. No, no what, what I'm saying though is going forward, we're also gonna try to look at ways of driving that cost down. It's not just short term. We, we, we think we, we can get there, so we're trying. I mean, we're, we're, the owners are committed to this thing. Um, we are, we, we're not happy. I can tell you that my owners aren't, aren't happy. Um, we're, we're, we're pushing, so, and these guys are very talented people, and, and we'll get there. It, it needed leadership change, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. So, and, and we're gonna, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you if I didn't think this, okay? So, but I appreciate the opportunity to do it, so. And we'd like, we really would like for you to come back periodically and give us an update. Or my replacement? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I will say this too, I, and I, I think that's part of it is, you can blame me for showing up, but I felt that we needed to at least be out here and tell the Prairie State story. They can, everybody can talk what's going on, but we got to tell our owners what the story is, and that's our obligation. So 
We changed the way we're doing a few things. I know I couldn't answer all your questions, and there's questions out there that I can't answer because of we got p competitive markets. We can't tell everything that we know because the competitors get it, and they're going to use it against us when you go buy replacement power. <laughs> Uh, for, for outages or things like that. So we've got to be careful what we say. But we're committed to this plant, and we're trying to be as transparent as possible. Okay? Thank you. Well, I just, I just want to thank you all also, but I want you to, to look out at the audience. And these are people that are depending on you to get those power rates down for them. I mean, you're the one that holds our future, and that's a big responsibility. We will try our best. Thank you. So, so we have we have a few uh, comments. Uh, Dave, did you want to say something? Uh, no, I just want to thank you, Mayor, for giving us the opportunity to come here. As Mark said, we we owe our owners an explanation, and that's why we're here tonight uh, to provide that. And we just don't want negative information and uh, floating around. And I know myself. I've been. Someone asked me if I was on the board of. Peabody Coal. Well, if I was, I'd have an obvious conflict of interest, but I'm not on the board of Peabody Coal. I never was and never will be, I'm sure. Uh, we do sit on the Prairie State Board as owners to represent ourselves because we're an equity owner in the plant. And we want it, we're aligned with everyone here. We want it to perform and give us the, the good things that we think is going to accrue from our being in this project. And so we're looking for that. And Dave, I do hear criticism of you being on the Prairie State Board, but that's not unusual for the general managers of the different groups to be on the board. No, all, all the people on the management committee are like Mark here and myself, and they're the general managers of their agencies, and uh, and they also appoint an alternate. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, we have, as I said, uh, I'm going to allow three minutes per person, and I don't think we have, we'll have to go over that time. Uh, the first one here. I, you call, can't they be seated? Sure. You all can have a seat. Okay, all of these are uh, about Paducah Power System except one. So we have here Gail Fry and Ken Fry. If you'll come forward, please. Hope you can see me above there. <laughs> and you live, Gail, on? On Briarwood. I am a Briarwood. consumer of Paducah Power. Right. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. I have done a lot of power poise. Yours was excellent. Uh, the bad thing is, and I'll say bad because we're all here because we're very upset about the rates, is that as if you were speaking to a lot of engineers or a lot of people who technically understand. When I listened to you, I felt like I was listening to a philandering husband or a wife who had been caught cheating. And all that you were doing was explaining why you were not producing. And your capacity, it seems like, that you went into business with us and contracted with us to produce a product that you cannot produce. And that is extremely frustrating. The other issue I have is that I've, I haven't heard anything. I know that you're terribly sorry. But there's nothing that's going to happen to any of you because of this. We have businesses that are struggling desperately. We have, I'm a small business owner with my husband. The rates do not affect what I produce, but it affects the ability of people to buy what I sell. And that in turn affects every one of the people in this audience, the people that didn't come. I'm not hearing anything from you that you're saying, I believe we can, we're really going to try. And Mayor, there is nothing, we don't have any way to prod these people to do something about the rates. I feel like that we're helpless. And that goes back to the contract that was evidently signed. And the consultant that advised us to sign a contract that I, listening to what each of you have said, 
sounds like a bad deal to me. I know when I was with the city, we did contracts. There was always an out. Someone had to produce. You had to give the product, or there was a penalty. If, uh, if one of our contractors did not get a Pacific street ready or my park ready on time, they had to pay a penalty. Where is the penalty? What is the incentive for Prairie State to reduce these rates? Are you going to give us a rebate? Any rebate here because you're not in production? I don't think that was in the contract. I know it wasn't in the contract. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Somebody did not watch that contract, did they? So, but that's a separate issue, and I hope that the city will be very careful now who they point to boards and how you review contracts. It, uh, this could absolutely strangle the city of Paducah. It's not good for business, but it's not just business. It's the people out there that are trying desperately to pay these rates. When I got my bill today, I was not a happy camper, but I can pay it. There are many people out there that are going to either have to pay their power bill or not eat or not buy clothing. That is unacceptable. And all you're saying is that I believe we can do it. We're really going to try. We're changing leadership. Gentlemen, that's not enough. Mayor, what can the city do to entice something to happen? I mean, I know Batavia, Illinois, did a class action, the, the, not the city, but several residents, for misrepresentation of what Prairie State could perform. And how they could and how they could provide the service. If you can't provide the service, then we have to go out on the market. Is this what is happening? And we're buying at huge rates because we're not we're not in a position to do, to do anything else. That was a very that's a poor contract. But it also, do we have anything? Do we have a a carrot on the stick? Do we have a anything that we can do? We're looking into all that. Okay, very good. I'm sure I'm over by three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You were very brave to come. <laughs> okay, we have Sue Reed, and she lives at 2837 Washington. Uh, I'm going to give up my three minutes, please. I think she said just about what I believe. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Okay, our next one is Mark Bryant. Hey, Mark. Oh. <laughs> He's timing you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Rhodes, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank all of you for obviously doing your homework because those are some tough questions you all were asking, in all seriousness, because this is very, very complicated. Uh, I have three questions, and I'm going to do it quickly because I, I know you want it done. Uh, whoever wants to answer this, if that Prairie State plant was originally to be a $1.8 billion plant running at 85% capacity. Uh, the power rates, I believe now, would be able to go down. But with a fixed cost over $5 billion, is there ever a time when Prairie State can deliver power at an affordable price? Anybody can answer it. Well, first, I think the uh, $1.8 billion figure is incorrect. Uh, Rick, what was the cost that you had associated with He's over here. The, the cost you had associated with the project when we first went in and made the decision uh, in 2007. I think it was 2.97 billion or something like that. In 2007 when you finance, when Kipa financed for the first time, the total hauling cost was just under 4 billion. Uh -huh. Okay, then I'll, I'll get to the next question shortly. My next question is, uh, I have received information that Paducah Power has $32 million in assets and about $600 million in debt. Why don't we immediately bankrupt this company and start getting our rates down quickly? Hmm. Anybody want to answer that? How would that affect this whole domino theory up there? All right. Now, the other question that I have, yesterday, Ray McLennan, who was the former uh, chairman of the board of Paducah Power System and on Kempa, sent this email out to the mayor and the city commissioners. And he said, the one big decision 
Prairie State May was to turn down a fixed price bid from uh, Fleur for $3.5 billion. They felt that Bechtel could build it cheaper and awarded a $3 billion cost plus contract. Under this contract, the cost continued to rise for various reasons. Later, toward the end of the contract, they entered into a fixed price contract with Bechtel for around $4.9 billion. I am not sure that Bechtel did a very good job in building the plant. We also have had trouble with the coal we bought from Peabody. It seems to contain more rocks than we believed it would. This has contributed to several breakdowns. That was the chairman of the board of Paducah Power System until yesterday, or day before yesterday, approximately 1.30 p.m. Anybody got any comments on what he had to say? Mark, Mark, you're an attorney. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, they they really can't comment on that. Um, oh, I wish they would because it's on the record, Mayor. <laughs> well, because of the other uh, groups that are in with Prairie State, it would okay. compromise. Well, I wouldn't want to compromise I mean, anybody, but that was a good question. You should understand that. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mark. You're pretty close. To Jay Campbell, please. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for coming. And most of what I have to say has probably already been said. It's one of the things about going forth, right? Um, and only having three minutes. I'm just going to read this real quick. Uh, my first question is kind of rhetorical for everyone. Um, so what was so wrong with TVA, right? Sounds like we had a good, reliable source of power, and we're just a little bit off, right? OK, so a couple of things I thought of while you guys were giving your presentation. You have a lot of coal. You're not using it right now as much. Could you sell that coal? Right? Is there something impeding you from selling coal, yes, maybe to recover transportation and no, facilities, it's or in the permit that we can only burn that coal. okay? Good to know. That was just, I mean, just a thought, right? You've got coal, maybe you could sell it, make some money back, or whatever. Okay, so um, you said it was hard to guess how low our rates might stabilize, or how low the PCA might eventually go once everything comes to to fruition. Um, of everyone in the world who might be able to guess where that PCA is going to go, you guys are probably the most qualified to know that. So, could you maybe guess for us? I mean, what what if we stick with this and we go with this and our community gets behind this and we stick with Prairie State and everything's happy and wonderful, how good could it get? What's the upside? Somebody, please, tell me something. Lie to me. Tell me something. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but I mean, do you, you, get, you understand what I'm asking, right? The only thing I can say is the upside would be better than it is now. Well, okay, that shouldn't be too hard, though, but, but I, appreciate, I appreciate that, right? Um, to that, right, it's something that somebody else mentioned, right? You talked about E4s improving and higher ROIs and... Um, sounds like you have some great balance sheets that are coming in a couple of years and that'll be great, but we can't burn your balance sheets this winter when it's cold and we're trying to heat our houses and I mean this is you're causing hardship for a lot of people. So I mean that's that's a bummer. Let's try to fix that, right? We don't we don't need these rates to be this high. It's causing real problems for real people. Um, so one of the things I thought of was maybe the Paducah Power could mitigate this problem by using some of those thirty million dollar cash reserves that uh, Mark Bryant just talked about. Maybe they could pay our PCA for a little while. I don't know how long that thirty million dollars would last. And I understand there's some issues with spending that down. It affects their credit rating and that kind of thing. Um, chances are good PPS isn't going to be buying any more stuff, big stuff, so their credit rating maybe isn't so important. But if they could pay that down, is that even a possibility? Is that even in the realm of possible? I'll leave that as rhetorical. You guys can answer that later. But PPS has a little bit of money. You could help us out there. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that if oh, you okay, mind. Great. But most of that money is associated with bonding requirements, sinking funds, and reserve requirements. Uh -huh of associated with the debt so right. i don't believe that option is there without risk to uh our credit rating for sure our credit rating as paducah city or as paducah power paducah power okay well i'm not again i'm not so worried about their credit rating but i mean i understand other people well. are so um well for real we just we need the power to be cheaper um okay last and getting to the end here sorry i'm coming up on three minutes i'm sure uh, the PPS contract to purchase power requires us to pay even if, we, even if you all don't produce at full level. Um, how long does that go on? How long can we wait for you all to come to the appropriate level of production before we end up realizing what a terrible deal? I mean, it, somebody spoke to what a bad deal it was that we have to pay for something we're not getting, and I get that that's how contracts are done, and I understand those, those issues within your industry. But at some point, you're not making enough power for us. We've got to go do something else, right? I can answer that. I mean, we have to pay the take a pay contract is in effect. In perpetuity until the bonds are paid off, and it is what it is. Okay. Is that, I mean, we're on board with that. Okay, so lastly, 
Hey, Jay. Jay, yes, three you're, minutes. You're three and a half. Oh, okay. Um, bail on Kempa, bail on PPS. The same thing he just said, right? What, what he just said was not a bad thought. I don't want to bankrupt anything. I want Paducah Power. I want Paducah people being happy buying Paducah Power and everybody paying cheap rates. But let's not be afraid to think out of the box. That was a good idea. Okay, next we have Jeff Parsley. He lives on Maywood Drive. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Parsley. I actually worked for TVA for 34 years, and the last two or three I was running all of TVA's coal plants. So uh, I've got a couple quick technical questions and then just a couple other things. So uh, what's the non-fuel dollars per megawatt hour cost on this plant? I noticed that wasn't there. You made a big deal out of the fuel cost, but what's the non-fuel O&M cost? You should Okay, if that's all right. You should, I mean, you ought to know it right off the top of your head. Uh, what's the ash content of the coal? 25%, right? Yeah. What's the ash fusion temperature of the coal, of that particular coal? And is it the good ash fusion, right ash fusion temperature for that boiler? And where is the slag? Nose arch, screen walls? I mean, I'm just saying. The slag was independence. It was independence. Okay. Uh, was this plant built with quite a bit of gray market material? I know the boiler would be considered gray market. How about other stuff? Pulverizers, pumps, feed pumps. Well, that was a lot of gray market material bought from other plants because all the other coal plants in the country were getting canceled during this time. But if we did save a lot of money on the boiler, it's a good thing because no telling how much more it would have went over budget. Uh, so is it true? Well, I know it's true. So we buy all this power at whatever the rate is. Let's just say it's $80 a megawatt right now because of poor performance. But it all gets sold on the market, right, at the closest hub to the plant. Every bit of it. It all gets sold on the market. Like today, the market was about $30. So you buy an $80 power, you're selling it for $30, you lose it. And then you go out and buy power at the market price at the MISO hub in Indiana, right? So we're buying $80 power, we're selling it for $30 or $2 in the middle of the night, losing $50 a megawatt, and then turn around and buying what our needs are. So we're buying high, selling low. Is that pretty? No, we, 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 we take the power and uh, we liquidate it at the nearest hub. Right. Correct. Or we buy it at the KULG interface. Right. And we have ARRs, known as auction revenue rights, that we hold, and we convert those into financial transmission rights. So. We're able to mitigate oh, yeah. quite a bit. About but we're losing time. money about every day, though, right, on our sales. And if the plant, if our portion of the megawatts of that plant are, say, 70 because it's not performing good, we can sell the 70, but we also got to buy the other difference between that and 112 megawatts or whatever. So we're buying that. We don't even have it to sell, right? Well, uh, when you look at a power plant, you look at the dispatch costs. I know. I know that's all variable. Cost is, that's all variable cost, that. but but your fixed costs are really high, and that's the cost of capacity. That's why the dollars per megawatt hour O and M cost would be really high. Is it true that when when you were with TVA, TVA served as the regulator, right? Yes. TVA regulated how much you could charge for power. Now there are is no regulation, right? You can sell really whatever you can. That's correct. Okay. Hey. Uh, so. Uh, we have to wrap it up. Okay, I'm wrapping it up okay. real quick. So one thing that really stuck with me, because you said up here, Dave, that we didn't really ever say that the power rates would be cheaper in TVA. We would be competitive. So, you know, in my best Columbo look, I'm thinking, man, did they really just say that? Because we've got a plant here in Paducah that has a $30 million payroll, employs 350 people, not to mention outage people and construction workers and all that, spends all kinds of money in the community, but we decided we wanted to risk $600 million of this of the ratepayers' money in issuing bonds so we could be competitive with what we already had. I just want to make sure that I understood that. Yeah. And the, la the last thing, Mr. Soderberg, I, uh, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, a lot of your facts were right, but it's just your conclusion was wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, looks like I have a neighbor here tonight, Vicki. 
You live at 317 North 9th. How are you tonight? I'm good, good. but not so good. Mm -hmm. Okay, mine is more personal. I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not a mechanical engineer, but I am a nurse. And I worked three jobs last winter because I had a power bill, $900. My mortgage is nearly $1,000. So with two bills, I paid nearly $2,000. I'm a single mother with two children. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Since y'all don't have a plan, if I lose my house, if me and my children have to go move in with my parents, I will seek a lawyer. And I will sue. That's all. And, if, and if, if they can't fix the problem, why can't the citizens of Paducah go to Jackson Purchase? Why can't we choose our provider? We have two. Can somebody answer that? Uh, it's all to do with who owns the lines. Well, what do we have to do to revise the lines? Uh, Dave, do you want to speak to that? I don't know how that could practically be done. Uh, well, we uh, there's a lot of things that's not practical tonight. We don't have any regulation in Kentucky. Let's just say that. Okay. Would you say that again? We do not have deregulation in Kentucky. So, therefore, where Paducah Power serves, people are bound are to, by to buy that you. from that. You don't have an option. Okay. Well, I had friends that had homes. They gave up their homes and they moved in apartments. I am a nurse. I make very good money. But there is no reason why I should have to give up what I bought at 20 years old because I can't afford the power this winter. Think about it. And I just want to, um, Nikki, I just want to say that I've known her a long time and I know how she has worked hard to get her education. I met you and your daughter at an event, how many years ago, four now? And uh, you know, I have to vouch for this young woman and her tenacity and her perseverance and what she has accomplished in her life. What's her name? And um, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. I am not surprised. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jeff Parker. Good evening. Good evening. I come to you as a Paducah Power customer, residential customer, also a small business owner that has Paducah Power and also as sitting on the board of McCracken County Board of Education. Uh, let me echo what's already been said. We don't have time. I mean, next spring when the housing market comes about, when you go to buy a new piece of property, what's the first thing you do? you go get the utility rates. Right. Who would buy a house or a business that was on Paducah Power and have jacked up rates that you can't afford to move into? And I, I understand what that young lady was saying. I was at the Paducah Power Board meeting yesterday. Mark, did, did your people show up? Did anybody from Paducah Power show up today off the board? He, he had people show up that that is taking a look at all this and he offered assistance and no charge right and and shame on you guys paducah power for not taking him up on it because that that, that would not have cost you a penny uh it's been a direct we need to address the situation this winter for the elderly and the people like that young lady that won't be able to pay their power bills and we need to do it quick you don't need to take time because we don't have time. We don't have the two to three years. We don't have six months. We have to address it now. Uh, whatever mistakes have been made, it, it really doesn't matter now. We're at a point where we have to fix it. Uh, I ask you to consider changing the power board. We have no county residents. You have that in your power, I'm sure. Don't. You don't? No. Why? Uh, because of the state statutes that regulates who I can appoint to the board. They can only be city residents. That's something, if you win the election, we need to work on. I didn't want to bring politics because into this, but I'll be more than happy to. Have, we have to work with our state legislators to get that change. Uh, and and it, it also appalls me Wait that... Let me tell you. Okay. 
because I firmly believe that it needs to, the statute needs to say within the service area, not just within the city of Paducah. But that I, and I agree. At the state. And, and I wonder where some of our legislatures are tonight. I really do. Uh, last but not least, you had a, uh, the chairman of the board step down yesterday. You have in your ability to appoint another person. Uh, you better find somebody like Mr. Parsley because I'm not knocking their board and I'm not knocking your chairman of Paducah Power. But I was at that meeting and they, I don't think they know a whole lot about what's going on or how it's going on and that's how we've got in the situation we're in. So you have your ability to, to put someone in there that does know power, the power business and, and we really need to, to strive on that. And uh, last but not least, I kind of feel sorry for the guys that are working for Paducah Power they get honked at and pop birds and everything else and uh, we 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 really have to bring this to a, to a head because they're they're taking a beating out there and it, they have nothing to do with with what's going on so thank you thank you very much I'd just like to say that um, I, t I did call um, State Representative Watkins. He was very helpful to me, introduced me to a fine gentleman that I met with today who was very helpful with, uh, with a lot of uh, issues that we're going through. So thank you, John. Uh, Bill Ford? Bill OK. Uh, Ronald Wood, is it Wood? Ronald Wood? Ward, Ronald Ward. Is it Ward or Wood? Ward. Ward. All right. Well, Mayor, you know I've been coming here since March. Mm -hmm. There's only one here. And I'm glad y'all are finally taking an active role trying to do something about this. I'm glad the news media is finally showing here. And I'm glad we had a huge crowd here tonight. And basically, what I'm going to talk about is something a little bit different, but very pertinent to the situation. They finally put their annual report on the... Uh, Internet? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've been analyzing the annual report. Before this started, back in 2012, uh, the rate was around 9.2% per kilowatt. 9.2 cents per kilowatt. Now it's 13.303. And uh, you, part of it is they're overcapacitized. They're looking at 120 kilowatts they're supposed to buy from uh, Prairie States. Plus they've got this a picking plant out here at over 100, plus I don't know what that's costing. They're, they've committed to buy 15 from that dam up at Smithland. And so on their debt load on that picking plant alone, uh, last year uh, they paid uh, $13,240,000 million in interest. Between now and 2038 on the picking plant alone, they've got a total interest and debt interest and principal due of $273 million. I mean, irregardless of whether, what the rates are going to be, the debt load is going to kill them. Then they've got around $440 million of KMPA debt. And it's at a high interest rate, 6.02%. But if their Moody's doesn't, if they don't change their position, they lost $1.7 million last year. Even if you read the Black and Veatch report, they're not even predicting to make a profit this year in 2014. They're only predicting to make profits from 2015 on down the road. They're liable to be downgraded, which they won't even be able to finance those bonds they're talking about at 6.02%. So, I mean, I'm just saying, regardless of the rates, I'm talking about a different thing, the debt is going to kill them. The, the $440 million of KMPA bonds are just fixed to amortize in 2013 and forward. And that's another 25 year debt. And the only other thing I was going to say is I got to study, and the lady from Princeton Powers here, apparently, I don't know how they're, but their rates are lower than ours. I don't know what they're doing to manage your situation so well. According to their website, their rate is 11.298. 11, 11 well, ours is 13.303. Uh, they're in the same boat they are, we are, but their rates are 20% lower. I mean, I wonder what they're doing right 
that we're doing wrong being in the same situation. Ron, <laughs> three minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank y'all. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have Mary Lamble. Is that right, Mary Lamble? Uh, yeah, I was going to talk about trash cans along the Greenway Trail. <laughs> There's a lot of trash out there. It's different every day. Somebody's obviously picking it up. I've met two women who pick it up in trash bags and take it home with them. There are signs that say leave no trace, but there's no way to leave no trace. I've asked one of the park rangers about putting trash cans out. He talked to J.P. Roberts, who said, we think they'll be vandalized. Somebody will burn the trash cans up. There are so many people on the trail these days. I don't think that's going to happen. But if we remove trash cans the 1st of December and don't put them back out to the 1st of March, I think that'll help that situation because it'll be heavily used between March and uh, December. I'm only asking for three trash cans at specific locations. One of them is on the dike near the Campbell Street entrance that can be chained to the um, shelter with the benches. One at Noble Park, just above the skate park. There are two trash cans at the skate park. If we just move one of those up to the top of the dike where all three trails meet, I think it would be so convenient. I can't take trash on my bike. I don't have a way to do it. And if I've got four and a half miles to ride, I won't be picking up trash unless I know there's a trash can up ahead that I can throw it in. And most of the people that walk along that trail are the type of people who would throw the trash in the trash can if it was convenient. Another one between the gravel at Noble Park and the beginning of Stuart Nelson Park is a very long stretch. That's the part that's most vandalized of anything, but we could use one trash can somewhere along there. And then in addition, um, I'd like one recycle bin. I've talked to Merle Pashtag at GPS. He's willing to man it. The best place is going to be at the um, two benches and shelter nearest the tunnel because that's just behind GPS and there's an access road that goes right to North 8th Street and he said he'd take care of it. Um, Mary? And it just as a trial, just to see would we collect enough because I see a lot of cans and bottles on the trail. I know, I, I can tell you've given it a lot of thought and it is a beautiful Greenway Trail. Uh, do you mind if I have Mark Thompson call you and talk with you about this? Oh yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Yeah, I've got I'm, your number here. Okay, yeah. So I'll have Mark call you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, th these are all the people that signed up to speak. Any other comments? Well, I, I appreciate everyone coming here today. I know that the only reason, just, just a minute. Okay, sure. How many months are we going to endure the current cost of electricity? How many months? How many years are we going to One, three, and what, what? Four years? What's the number? I think that's been a question we've we've all asked yeah. and hope for an answer too soon. Well, I thought you said yeah. 2018 is when they Well, stabilizing, yes. Yeah. Uh, when, we, when we are delinquent with the payment of our bill, how many months do we have before you shut off the power? None. How many days? Please answer to the power. How long? How long can I be delinquent? <laughs> Well, I don't have that answer for you tonight. I don't think they do either. Well, I mean, we're all up there with you. My power bill was $683 this month. And, and that's, and that's, that's tough. And I turned my thermostat up to 77 and it was still that. So, you know, we're, we're all, we all understand what's going on here. It's, it's, a, it's, prob it's probably the most serious problem for Paducah since the Great Flood. It really is. Yes, that's Jeff? True. If I could, Mayor, uh, 
I got some figures together today, and my wife told me not to say anything, but I've been in trouble before with her. And uh, the city last year, your, your power bill was somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.7 million for the city of Paducah. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to increase it by a third. Who's paying for it? Me and everybody else in this room, the taxpayers. Baptist Health, $3.7 million. I guess you man is picking that bill up. All I really have to say, I don't think Mr. Peabody's coal train stopped in Muhlenberg County. I think it rolled through McCracken and took us to the cleaner, is what I think. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, thank you, Mark, for, for agreeing to work with Paducah Power. And I think Hardy has uh, some good ideas uh, for uh, some extra help with Paducah Power, which I think is going to be real positive. So uh, thank you. We'll continue our meeting. <laughs> Commissioner Abraham, do you want to go on with the minutes? I will. I'll just hang on a second. Let's go on. Richard, let's go on. Let's, let's go, go ahead. On. Okay. I move that the reading of the minutes for September 16, 2014 City Commission meeting be waived and that the minutes of said meetings prepared by the City Clerk be approved as written. Second. City Clerk. Aye. Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Rhodes? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Kaler? Aye. Commissioner Galt, please. I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled. I don't have a Board of Adjustment. That's you. Oh, I'm supposed to read it first. It's okay. No, it's all right. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't have one at all. Whereas subject to the approval of the Board of Commissioners, I hereby reappoint William Baxter as a member of the Board of Adjustment. This term will expire August 31st, 2018. Whereas subject to the approval of the Board of Commissioners, I hereby reappoint. Is that not right? William Baxter. There's only one appointment. Okay. I don't say something about Mayor Kayla's reappointment. No. William Baxter, as member of Board Adjustment, this term will expire August 31st, 2018. Second. Oh, I should have had you read this page. Sorry. <laughs> okay, but I just. We'll just, do that over. But I just relax. Yeah, I didn't understand what you were talking about. Um, just, we're all good. Okay. <laughs> I just thought you were talking about reappointment, but the name is right. <laughs> Good. Good. And call the roll. Yes. Can we vote? <laughs> did I get a second. Yeah. You no, did. You guys have me all confused now. You got a second. You're good. Call the roll. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner Galt. Aye. Commissioner Rhodes. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Kaler. Aye. Commissioner Rhodes, please. Okay, I move the following documents be received and filed. Documents, certificates of liability, insurance, Tabor Crane Construction Services, Fallen Electric Company, Mertco Incorporated, Heflin Incorporated, Commissioner's Deeds, 1131 Tisney Street, and 1234 North 12th Street. Notice of cancellation of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Paducah for September 9, 2014, Owens Property, 5065 Concord Avenue, a settlement of agreement and release between City of Paducah, Allstate Insurance Company, and Betty Owens, and a quick, a quick claim deed. <coughs> Number five, contracts for services, Yeiser Art Center, Paducah Symphony Orchestra, Luther F. Carson, Forever Center, Incorporated. Number six, West Kentucky Community and Technical College, Television Department, annual report for July 2013, June 2014. Number seven, Paducah Waterworks Financial Highlights for July 2014. And eight, Transcript of Proceedings for City of Paducah, Kentucky, Taxable General Obligation Bond, Refunding Bond, Series 2014B, Police and Firefighters Pension Fund, $4,222,000. Second. Okay, we have a resolution tonight. We need to vote. Oh, yes, please. Commissioner Abraham. Quick. Aye. Commissioner Galt. Aye. Commissioner Rhodes. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Kaler. Aye. 
A resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, Paducah Power Electric Plant Board Call to Action. Whereas the Electric Plant Board was formed by the Little TVA Act of 1942, and the board has a separate governance structure with board members appointed by the Mayor of Paducah and approved by the Board of Commissioners, and whereas our community depends on abundant, reliable, and affordable power, and whereas for several months the citizens of McCracken County who depend on Paducah Power for services have expressed great concern over rising power costs associated with the unreliability of the Prairie State Campus Generation Facility. And whereas the community demands action from Paducah Power System to find a solution to the rising rates of electricity and to secure our community's future. And whereas the mayors has contacted the the mayor has contacted the Kentucky Attorney General, the Secretary of Energy, and members of the congressional delegation to express our community's concern. And whereas the Electric Plant Board discussed at its t September 22nd, 2014 meeting steps to investigate current fiscal response obligations, look at cost-cutting measures, and conduct a process to select a new general manager. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Commissioners of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, Section 1, that the Board of Commissioners strongly urge the Electric Plant Board to do the following on the behalf of our city and its citizens. Hire an independent expert to investigate the information on which the decision to invest in the Prairie State Campus was made. Hire an expert in utility matters to investigate current financial obligations. Promptly proceed with the process currently underway to hire a search firm to assist in the recruitment and selection of a successor to the retiring Paducah Power System General Manager. Enhance and communicate to the public attainable programs to help customers with current bills created from recent power cost adjustments. And consider and provide opportunities for the community to become a full and open partner in determining the fate of our community and the Paducah Power System. This resolution shall be in full force and effect from and after its adoption. I need a second, please. Second. Mayor, after listening to their report tonight, can we have discussion? Sure. After listening to their report tonight, and, and I know that they're a separate corporate entity mm -hmm. run by their power board, but could we, I, honest, honestly, honestly feel like we should change that word strongly urge to just demand? Is it strongly word? It says strongly urge. Oh, I thought it was going to be demand. Demand that they do this. I really feel that way because I, I don't feel like I got answers tonight about when we might get a change. And I, I just feel like strongly urge leaves that little bit of wiggle room for them. And I, I really feel like it's our responsibility to protect the citizens and our well, businesses and our community. And since we don't have direct authority over it, we could at least from us say we demand that they take some steps. Well, a couple of things. I agree with you. Uh, and, and tonight, those folks that were watching at home and folks were asking me, you know, exactly what was going to happen tonight. We had two group, you had two two separate conversations. Uh, the Prairie State guys, they really couldn't tell you when that facility would be up running at full capacity, 85 percent. They they couldn't tell you because there's too many variables in there. The other conversation was. Um, the what you just read, the responsibility of Paducah Power, making the decision to leave TVA, which currently has turned out to be a horrible decision, and accountability for that decision. Uh, the board, the chairman of the board resigned. Uh, the only other person on that board, um, I believe, that was on that board when the decision was made is, is Mr. Clark. So you make decisions, there's consequences for them. Now, it doesn't do anything about our rates because we're still having to, you know, endure those. But uh, I, I think demand would be appropriate. I, I believe these actions would at least help us to understand and help them to push for answers quicker. Anything so, we can do, I think we should do to help. I just feel like it's the strength of the city. We should say we demand that they take these actions. Do you want to change this? I do. Okay. I second that, if that's appropriate. Do I need to read it again? No, you just with the word change. You want to amend the resolution to stray demand in section one instead of strongly urge. You, you know, I attended their board meeting yesterday, and, and I think they're 
and, and Jeff, I mean, you can speak to this better than I can. I, I do think the board is really struggling with what to do. Uh, as Mr. McLennan's gone and, and none of them were present when the decision, you know, none of the board members that are left are present when the decision's made, they understand. I, I truly believe that current board members understand the dilemma, but I think they're struggling with what to do, how, how, where to even start. Uh, you know, you have a conversation with Tuffy Roberts, the newly elected chair, and I, I know we've discussed it with Jeff and Mark Workman, who's been there less than a month. And I did not talk to Mr. Jones, but they're, I think they just don't know. They have a set of steps. It's obviously, some of those are outlined there, but, and, and we have no control over them, obviously. We, you know, we're just, we want something done on behalf of the citizens, mm -hmm. but, but I, I did after my discussion with uh, Tuffy Roberts. Right. I felt like he is willing to make changes. I agree. And I agree. he is going to address those as quickly as he can. And I think the strength of the city demanding that these changes be made will help to speed that up. Well, it starts with a first step. Uh, I agree. So, and yesterday was a first step because I don't believe we would be making these changes under previous leadership. So I'm uh, a new board chair i think should help would help set that and i know by state statute jeff represents the city on that board and i, I feel uh -uh. like that that he can help them to understand how important this is and it is an issue that's going to just the only concern i have so about bad. that and i fully understand where you're coming from on that but at the end of the day paducah power has to be financially solvent it has to meet its debt obligations and financially if it were possible to lower rates if it had been yesterday we would have so the expectation that we do that if the demanding we take those steps is one thing but the expectation from the demand that a rate increase happen from that <laughs> i i don't know necessarily that 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 can happen within a certain period of time. I think of all the factors, um, and it's my belief, my read, that of all the factors um, that could allow that to happen, that the Prairie State uh, efficiency attainment of 85%, give or take, whatever was said tonight, is it. And I think you got about as good a read on that as is possible tonight uh, without getting a guarantee. What you got is assertion and assurance that the effort was being made and you know certain changes have been made up there. But that is one thing that uh, what, what the Duke of Power Board can do is hold people's feet to the fire per state, mm. the accountability thing. But that doesn't necessarily mean that mechanical issues unforeseen might not still happen for a period of time i think they need to look at all steps jeff there are other things that could be done i don't have a copy of it in front of me if that needs to is there a thing in uh, a statement did it say demand them lower the cost immediately or it was to strive for it isn't it well and i think that's what that, that needs to be that word needs to be added I'm not sure how that w how that was going to be worked in. Maybe we just need to figure out where that goes. I think I have a copy on my phone. Uh, the Board of Commissioners demand that the Electric Plant Board demand the Electric Plant Board do the following is the way it would read. And instead of strongly urge, demand, and that's hire an independent expert to investigate the information on which the decision to invest in Prairie State Campus was made, hire an expert in utility matters to investigate current financial obligations, promptly proceed with process currently underway to hire a search firm for the general manager. So that's where the word demand would go in. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. And then she's going to make that change. Okay, first we need to vote on the amendment. Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Rhodes? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Kaler? Aye. Commissioner Wilson, please. Uh, wait just oh. a moment. You have to vote on another one? Yeah. Okay. Then we want to vote on the resolution as amended. 
and adopt it as the adopted the resolution as amended. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner Galt. Aye. Commissioner Rose. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Kaler. Aye. Oh, is my turn. Commissioner Wilson, please. Upon the recommendation of the city manager, the board of commissioners of the city of Paducah order that the personnel changes on the attached list be approved. Second. Hi, it's Steve. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Any questions? Most notably, three police officer mm -hmm. uh, new hires tonight. I think we still have about four to fill, and that's that's in process, um, going through interviews. So there'll be there'll be another batch coming forward, uh, hopefully. And I think I think you got their biographical information of the. It looks very impressive. New hires, yes. Female officer coming on board too. Saw that. Okay, Commissioner Abraham, please. Oh, we have to vote on that. Yes, yes ma'am. <sighs> Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner Galt. Aye. Commissioner Aye. Rhodes. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Kaler. Aye. Commissioner Abraham, please. I move that a municipal order entitled a municipal order authorizing the application for a grant in the amount of five thousand dollars to the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet for the Paul. Uh, Paula Name Memorial Education Grant for Bicyclists and Pedestrian Safety be adopted. Second. Steve. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Uh, this is for a after-school program and then the start of some bicycle safety within our community uh, over the next fiscal year. We're still working on some of the um, um, the things that we're actually going to be doing with a grant, but uh, generally that's what it's for. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Schools on schools on board, going to have some bike racks, a few things like that if they're going to ride to school. It's going to be, what we're looking at now is more of an educational component for after school programs. Are they going to, I mean, are they, are the school boards behind it, they're cool with having some bike racks and some place to chain your bike down? We have not gotten into that at this point. <laughs> All right. I just. Let me call a roll. City Clerk. I'm sorry, Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Commissioner Rhodes. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Taylor. Aye. Commissioner Galt, please. I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement between the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Department of Housing, Buildings and Construction, Division of HVAC, and the City of Paducah, Kentucky. This ordinance is summarized as follows, that the mayor is hereby authorized to execute an agreement between the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Department of Housing, Buildings and Construction, HVAC Division, and the City of Paducah, Kentucky. The city shall assume primary plan review, inspection and enforcement responsibility under 81 KAR 7120, the Kentucky Building Code, 815 KAR 7125, the Kentucky Residential Code, and other applicable law for initial HVAC installations and major repairs or substantial alterations to an HVA system within the geographical boundaries of the City of Paducah. Said jurisdiction is limited to HVA systems installed in buildings over which the City of Paducah has jurisdiction pursuant to KRS 198B060. This, this agreement is for a term of three years. However, it may be canceled as described in KRS 198B-6673 and 815-KR-8100. Second. City Clerk. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner Galt. Aye. Commissioner Rhodes. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Kaler. Aye. Commissioner Wilson, please. Nope, I'm next. Uniforms. Mm -hmm. You're next. I moved it. Spam. Yep. Okay. Uh, I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled an ordinance approving the change order number four with bluegrass uniforms incorporated for uniforms for the fire department employees and authorizing the mayor to execute said order said change order. This ordinance is summarized as follows that the city of Paducah, Kentucky hereby approves and accepts change order number four with bluegrass uniforms incorporated to update and add items to the original contract along with additional items that have been discontinued by the manufacturer. Second. City Clerk. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Galt. Aye. Commissioner Rhodes. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Kaler. Aye. Commissioner Wilson, please. I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute a contract with Paducah Junior College, Inc. for the Community Scholarship Program. This ordinance is summarized as follows, that the mayor is hereby authorized to execute a contract with Paducah Junior College, Inc. in the amount of $125,000 for the Community Scholarship Program. This contract shall expire June 30th, 2015. Second. City Clerk. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner Galt. Aye. Commissioner Rhodes. 
Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Taylor? Aye. Commissioner Abraham, please. I move that the Board of Commis uh, Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled an ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute a contract with Barkley Regional Airport for providing general av av aviation and air carriage services. This ordinance is summarized as follows that the mayor is hereby authorized to execute a contract with Barkley Regional Airport in the amount of $136,430 payable in quarterly installments of $34,107.50 each for providing general aviation and air carrying services to the citizens of McCracken County and surrounding regions. This contract shall expire June 30th, 2015. <coughs> Second. Thank you. We've discussed all this earlier, so City Clerk. Mr. Abraham? Aye. Mr. Galt? Aye. Mr. Rhodes? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mayor Taylor? Aye. Commissioner Galt, please. I don't have another one. When we're taking it off. I thought that's, oh, that's the one we're taking off. All right. Okay. We still have to. Um, do we have to do something for that? We do. Do you agree? Yes, I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance mm -hmm. an ordinance amending Chapter 2 Administration of the Code of Ordinances. Yes, we have to put the motion on the floor first. Of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, this ordinance is summarized as follows. That the City of Paducah hereby amends the ordinance in Chapter 2 of the Paducah Code of Ordinances by deleting the residency requirement to serve on the Paducah-McCracken County Riverport Authority. Second. Okay. Does that mean you're removing the residency requirement? Well, we're just putting it on the floor. Now we need someone to make a motion to table it. Make I'll make, okay. Do I need to make that motion? I'll make the motion to table it. Okay, here it Second. is. Second. I'll say, I'll say the motion. Good forward, you guys. <laughs> I move that an ordinance introduced on September 16th, 2014. Do we need to vote on that first before I read this? No, she just made the motion, so you're reading it for okay. her. I move, Mr. I move that an ordinance introduced on September 16th, 2014 and entitled an ordinance amending Chapter 2, Administration of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah be tabled. Second. Well, you guys have already first. <laughs> okay, good. Now I just need to call the roll. Mr. <laughs> Abraham. Aye. Mr. Galt. Aye. Mr. Rhodes. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Mayor Kaler. Aye. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have city manager's report. I have nothing. Okay. <coughs> Any other mayor or commissioner comments? No. We've got a great barbecue festival coming up. Kicks off with pork stock, which is actually not part of the, it's a private ticketed event, mm -hmm. but anyone can still purchase tickets, I believe. There are a few still left. Um, and then Thursday morning at 11 o'clock, it starts. Dragon Boat Festival was fun last week. Right. Great crowd. Mm -hmm. It was. Great crowd. I paddled in the first race, and then I went home. <laughs> 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 That's hard work. <laughs> I looked for you in the second. And couldn't. No. Okay, no. that explains I went home to scrape paint. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any public comments? And we don't have an executive session no, tonight. Man. Thank you for inviting Prairie State here tonight. I think yeah. it was a right move. We needed to hear from them. Whether we liked it or not, we needed to hear it and get it all out and take some action. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I've told each of you, the people that I've reached out to, I'm still working on that. Yes. So, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get some answers. I know you have a board appointment. Yes. So, I mean, I know I've been asking around today. I'm sure you have, too, for some people that live, must live in the city right. and would have the time to dedicate to it. Yep. And, you, and that'll be coming at probably at the next meeting or next two meetings? Mm -hmm. Well, now I, I'll be out of town for a couple of meetings. I've got a KLC conference on the 7th, and then I won't be back on the 14th. Will we be meeting next week? No, not next it's week. Tuesday. Tuesday. I know there's been interest expressed to bring other people in here to give more of the other side of the story. Have they asked for, I mean, have you talked to them about being on agenda at a meeting as a workshop? There's only one person. Okay. 
you know, I, th I don't know how you all feel about it. You know, do we bring do we bring several more people in to talk to us? I mean, it could go on and on. Do what to? I mean, to talk to us. Mistakes that's been made. Well, I guess they wanted to talk to us about things that could be done. I think, that and I guess we're imploring the Paducah board. Power Board encourage them really to talk to them. They should go to the Power Board. Yeah. Well, I, th I think, think that's part of the. Um, investigations that were in that resolution and that in, in fact the Paducah Power Board uh, discussed um, yesterday and um, we actually uh, what I believe the gentleman that wants to speak to us or bring someone in uh, was asked uh, if he could suggest some resources that we could look to to help in, in investigation of some of the uh, validity issues with respect to some of the assumptions that were made and given to us by consultants and Peabody and whomever when the decision was made all those many years ago so the board has started to reach out uh, and take advantage of, of uh, those resources that have come forth well we'll inc then encourage them to continue to push with and, Paducah and Power Board talking with him okay because I mean I think he wants the best for Paducah absolutely, absolutely. everyone that showed up tonight wants the best for Paducah well, then, it, if there were any mistakes made or misrepresentation, it was at the it beginning. To be ferreted out. It was. It was at the beginning. So, having someone go back and look at that, look at those those moves right there, would be appropriate. Because I, I think he said he. They never said that they felt like they were misled. Yeah. That would have been Paducah Power. Wouldn't might have been Prairie Fire State. So, I think they need to be encouraged to go back and look at that. And that was in part of that. Too. Yeah. Because presently, there's not a lot of incentive to go back and look at anything. So, good meeting, good questions. Thank right. you. Meeting's adjourned.